we now recognize that birds are dinosaurs, what I study is the long, deep evolution of birds from Mesozoic dinosaurs. The very concept is unimaginable. Why, if that happened, we wouldn't have a chance. How could we possibly hope to fight them? We couldn't, you're right. You're right, Mrs. Bundy. Hurry up, children, finish your lunch. Are the birds going to eat us, Mommy? Birds have been on this planet since Archaeopteryx, 140 million years ago. Doesn't it seem odd that they'd wait all that time to start a, a war? Who said anything about a war? All I said is... Troodon probably fed on our ancestors, the early mammals. It is the most intelligent, adaptable, and successful hunter on the planet. You gotta check your mirrors, just side of your eye. Side of your eye. Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. It's really good to have you here. We're having a very special, kind of rare early stream today. Well, I guess it's only really special because it is early. And you know what? Because you're here, too, it's special. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here today. If it's your first time, which it probably is for somebody, I imagine, whether you're watching live, or whether you're watching later on in the VOD, or on YouTube, I'm glad you're here. Welcome, welcome. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. A paleontologist is a fossil scientist, as you probably knew already. I specialize in dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are what I study, what I publish on in the scientific literature, and what I dig up during the summers. Really, really jazzed to be back out there at the end of May. Uh, in Wyoming, digging up some more dinosaurs, and I'll be live streaming that as much as I can, so stay tuned for that. Just like we did last year, we're going to have uh, even more live science outreach from the field. Not just telling you what it's like to dig up dinosaurs, but showing you, taking you along for the ride. That's the best way that I know how to actually like bring fossil science to the people, so it's kind of the whole point of this channel. That's why I call it Paleontologizer. 
treating paleontology more like a verb than a noun. Maybe how we do it, you know? Anyway, I'm glad you're here. Um, today we're going to be talking about fieldwork a little bit. We're going to be looking at some videos, we're doing all kinds of Q&A, and, uh, I'm glad you're here. This is great. Now, the reason I'm streaming early today, extra, extra early, is because, uh, I'll have to leave a little bit earlier today, because I'm going to go see Dune 2 with Ios and Delta Rain later, and that's going to be a ton of fun, so... Excited for that. I've heard it's I've heard it's better than the first one. So Dune 2. More Dune. Let me go see it tonight. Um But yeah, yeah. And Nathaniosaurus says Carnotaurus skull behind Danny? Not quite Carnotaurus. But a different big theropod. What we used to call a carnosaur back in the day. Uh, apparently, that term is has come back. Um, but yeah, this is this is not a, a ceratosaur like Carnotaurus. This is instead. There are ceratosaurs, right? Abelisaurs or ceratosaurs? This is a tetanuran theropod instead. Yeah. Um. But hello, sweetie pie. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome, sweetie. If you want to come up on the desk and say hello to everybody, I'm sure they'd love to see you. Yeah. Um, anywho. Yeah. Um. Well, well, well. Sweetie Pie. What's shaking with you? How are you doing? She's like, you're on early. I am Sweetie Pie. Yeah. How you doing, Sweetie? Yeah. Um. Yeah, yeah. And June 2nd, I'll be in the field. By the time June 2nd rolls around, Tommy Platicus. Oh, sweetie pie. Yeah, you're gonna miss me, aren't you? You'll be able to watch me on stream if you feel like it, sweetie pie. <laughs> it's, it's a cat stream now, everybody. The mammals have taken over. Uh, anyway, it's so good to see everybody here. And hey, Arlay, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Sorry you're allergic. I can try and scoot the camera back a little bit, but... You're shedding up a storm here, sweetie pie. You're shedding so much fur. Yeah, it's springtime. And ended yesterday with a cat stream, and began yesterday with a cat stream, too. The first frame was of a cat on camera. The cats are just taking over. Anyway, let's see who's here. Not too many people since we're starting so early. Uncharacteristically early. We've got Rachel Darling Endeavors was first today. How are you doing, Rachel? Welcome, welcome. Uh, TMK DK, it's good to see you as well. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Tommy Plotticus with the early crew there. Yeah, Tommy Plotticus, what's shaking? And Paleo Ken, Ken, I hope you're doing well. Interesting that you put the extra A in there. It's like the the imperial spelling of paleo. What do you think about that, sweetie pie? Yeah, I like how the camera's focusing on you. I'm out of focus back here. It's it's your stream now, sweetie pie. Do you have anything you want to plug? She's like, um, catnap? Uh, a warm windowsill? Watching birds out, out the window? Uh, Matt, I'm 33. How are you doing? It's good to have you here. Welcome, welcome. Brow, hello, hello. I hope you're doing well, too. Oscar Juniors, what's shaking with you? Farning81, thank you for being here. Stream closed captioner, you should be working right now. And, uh, and you are. Excellent. Very good. Jedi Mega Man, what's going on in your world? Majestic Biscuit, how are things with you? Sandwich Nom Nom, hello, hello. Triple Helix. And Giorno Giovanna, I'm glad you're here too. Welcome, welcome, Cephalon Wolf. It's good to see you. Golganek, how are you doing? I don't know if uh, sandworms would fossilize well. I... Yeah, I bet they would. Uh, I don't know, if you have enough moisture to be able to permineralize them properly, 
I would think on a desert planet as dry as Arrakis, that might be tricky. But I don't know. I don't know. Also, Aeolian preservation is interesting. I, yeah, windblown sand. Dormir Bell says, hello, science friends, and hello to you, Dormir Bell. Welcome, welcome. Le Petit Prince Encore. How are you doing, Petit? Uh, and Niffler. Howdy, howdy to you. I hope you're having a good one so far. Glad you're here. Jenna Baby Girl says, aw. Aw. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Paleo Ken says, I was hoping to avoid people thinking I was on a diet. Just let them think what they want. I don't know. <laughs> you just, it makes you sound very commonwealth. Paleo Ken. Yes, hello. My name is Paleo Ken. Welcome to PaleoCast. Uh, yeah, clearly Sweetie Pie is very into the dinosaur talk. Apparently, Dormir Bell. She is just in her happy place right now. Yeah. And Nova Ninja 321. Howdy, howdy, Nova Ninja. Welcome to Paleontologizer. I'm glad you're here. I promise this is usually not as cat centric, but here we are, you know? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> if only I could, I could train Sweetie Pie to move her mouth, then I could time my words to her mouth movements and uh, and she could host the screen. But this, I think, is the closest we're going to get. Uh... Anywho. Yeah. Paleo Ken says, I get to disappoint people when they find out I'm not British. <laughs> I don't know if that's disappointing, Paleo Ken. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Says, and Raven says, are you working on your PhD? I am not. No. This is what I do full-time nowadays. And it offers me a tremendous amount of freedom, which I really appreciate. Yeah, ha, huh, sweetie pie. Are you looking at your reflection? Is that what you're doing? Are you looking at your reflection in the camera? I know you're not at this moment, but when her eyes kind of lock with the camera, like here, I kind of feel like she's looking at herself. What do you see in there, sweetie pie? What do you see in there? Nova Ninja says, I love cats. I have a 10-year-old turtle. Oh, very cool. Oh, turtle shell female cat. Sorry. And she is adorable. You know, that's cool too, Nova Ninja. It's funny, the line break there. It says, I have a 10-year-old turtle. <laughs> Welcome, Nova Ninja. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Majestic Biscuit says, Sweetie Pie knows we are here. I think she might. Yeah. What do you have to say to chat, Sweetie Pie? Yeah. Okay. Good points. Very well spoken. Johnny Mega Man says, does this camera have movable parts for when it's focusing? Uh, all the focusing is inside. It's not like my other cameras, which have a manual focus on them. They have a little focus ring that I have to manipulate with my digits. This one is automatic. And uh, at least she's willing to share a screen. I know, but a little bit more accommodating than Mini Pie was last night, for certain. Texas Crypto says, Sweetie Pie says she needs more treats. Is that true, Sweetie Pie? Hey, do you want some treats? Would you like that? Yeah? Okay. I think something can be arranged. Ooh. Oh, that smelled gross. But I know you like it. Yeah. Is that there for you? Okay. Well, I guess she was just here for the treats. Or she prefers to eat them on the floor. And Anwar 2039, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologize. It's good to have you here. Welcome, welcome to the channel. We're going to talk fossils here. Um, 
But yeah, yeah. Nova Ninja says, what do you do on this channel? Is it paleontology science? It is indeed. You, you arrived just after my little spiel that I do at the beginning. But you know what? Let's... Let's call forth... A different previously recorded Danny. That'll work. Mm -mm. And here, let me get this set up properly for viewing. There we go. Bear with me here. Hi, everybody. It's great there to have you here. Hopefully you can hear me. Let me know if you can't. Yeah, excellent. Good, good, good. Yeah. Well, hello, hello, everybody, and greetings from wild and beautiful eastern Utah. Digging here in last the Cedar Mountain Formation, the very, very beginning of the Cretaceous period. And uh, we just got here last night, started to set up camp. We finished setting up camp this morning, or mostly finished anyway. And we uh, opened up the quarry Thank you, Ken. today. So, uh, hmm. welcome everybody. You are in for such a treat. Uh, yeah. Anyway, let me introduce myself real quick. Um, my name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. And, uh, I'm going to fill I this up with water real quick. paleontology right here on Twitch. Um, it is my honor and privilege to be able to, uh, to share fossil science with all of you, including field work like this. I'm streaming right now via satellite. There's the Starlink dish right there. And, uh, yeah, I wanted to do something unique to kind of not just tell, but show people how dinosaur paleontology works. How do we find dinosaurs? How do we dig them up? How do we get them out of the ground and back to the laboratory? That's what this is all about. So, uh, welcome, welcome, everybody. And, uh, I should also acknowledge everybody who's made this possible through their, uh, financial support through subscribing and gifting and cheering and everything else i could not do this without all of you so thank you very very much for that yeah, yeah. and uh anyway what do i do here i'm gonna be back out in the field in a little over two months now the end of may i'm gonna be out in uh in wyoming digging up dinosaurs and broadcasting that for all to see but for the time being, I'm here in my office in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we're gonna go over some fossil news. We're gonna answer your questions. We're just gonna have a nice casual kind of Q and A time here. So I hope you're excited for that, Nova Ninja and other new folks. It's amazing you get to do this. I know, right? Holy cow! This is a dream come true to be able to do this full time. This is my full time job now. You could call me the world's first full time live streaming paleontologist and you'd be right I love my job and uh, I hope that comes across in these broadcasts yeah Sun NC says will we run out of fossils one day uh, in certain places you can for a while but fossils are a non-renewable resource but we are nowhere close to running out of, of fossils in general especially when you talk about micro fossils Know, stuff like that. The if anybody's ever heard of the White Cliffs of Dover, these are almost entirely made out of fossils. Fossils of ancient microorganisms. The the tiny tiny shells of basically like fossil plankton. That's what makes up the White Cliffs of Dover. Oil is made from fossils. Coal is made from fossils. Compressed plant fossils for coal. For oil, it's again like the Cliffs of Dover. The the preserved remains of ancient microscopic sea creatures. Basically fossil plankton. But yeah, yeah. Anyway. Um, but with that being said, in certain areas, if you get like poachers or, you know, weekend warrior collectors you know, collecting fossils in certain areas, they can just hoover everything up in a given area, and it might be years, could be decades, before more fossils start to get exposed by erosion. And this has been a problem in a lot of places in Utah, Wyoming, Colorado. 
certain places in uh, in Montana too, where I used to work. Weird adult says which formation in Wyoming? The Hell Creek? No, the Almond Formation. Weird adult. We don't really have a lot of Hell Creek in Wyoming. The kind of Hell Creek equivalent is called the Lance Formation in Wyoming. You get Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops and their friends in the Lance Formation in Wyoming. I don't know if Wyoming has much Hell Creek at all. It's all. I think it's pretty much all Lance there. But the Almond Formation is a very poorly studied geological formation in the late Cretaceous of Wyoming, and there are currently zero dinosaurs that are actually known there that have been named from this formation. So we've got something that looks kind of like Anchiceratops, but it's indeterminate. Dromaeosaurus, teeth, indeterminate. Edmontonia, indeterminate, etc., etc. Paranicodon, this should be indeterminate as well, but it's not listed as such. We found a bunch of dinosaurs there over the past few years. That was their last year with Ethan Cowgill and Ken here in the chat and the rest of our crew. And we found several new dinosaur specimens. And we were digging up some ones that were found the previous summer as well. We're going to go back at the end of May. And we are going to be digging some of those up and likely finding some new ones too. The exciting thing is just about any dinosaur that we find there, chances are it's going to be a new species, if not a new genus. So it's... Um, it, it's groundbreaking stuff, in a way. Not in a pun way, either. Not just we're breaking ground, literally. But we're... We're gonna be... Filling a gap in our knowledge of late Cretaceous North American dinosaur fauna. So that's gonna be pretty cool. Yeah. Um... Anyway, yeah... Miss Yvette says, are what owls spit out fossils? Hopefully not. Owls shouldn't be eating fossils in the first place. No, those are... The owl pellets are not fossils, Miss Yvette. Fossils have to be buried and permineralized, I guess. So yeah, yeah. Owl digestion does not permineralize fossils. At least not in the way that we think of when we think about fossilization. Yeah. Murph wants to know, are there any marsh specimens in museum collections not described from that region? Probably, Murph. Uh, both Marsh and Cope did a lot of work in Wyoming, mostly around, like, Como Bluff or the other south in, like, the Uinta Basin. Um, yeah, I think they may have also done some work up in the Crazy Mountains up north in Wyoming, but I'm not... I'm not sure. I bet you there are some specimens in the collections of museums that have not been published yet from Marsh and Cope and, uh, and their crews. Yeah. Miss Yvette says, what are you going to do for May the 4th? Presumably we're going to be digging, Miss Yvette. Yeah. Same with June the 4th and July the 4th. Maybe not July the 4th. We'll see. But yeah, yeah. The outcharge says fossils are stone, right? Well, here, let's... It seems like we've, we're getting this question kind of a bit right now. So let's watch a classic video. Kind of helps explain that. If any of you have ever wanted to become a fossil before... Well, here's a step-by-step -step guide on how to do that. Here's a step-by-step -step guide to becoming a fossil. Step 1. Die. Once you are dead, your remains may be scavenged by other organisms. Step two, get buried fast. Yeah. If you are buried rapidly, your remains won't completely decay or be carried away by scavengers. Yep. Your best bet for rapid burial is to die near or in a river, lake, or ocean where water can deposit sediment over you. Step three, soak in groundwater for a long, long time. Yep. So this is the actual fossilization process, what we call permineralization, where parts of your skeleton get replaced by mineral. Step three, soak in groundwater yeah. for a long, long time. There you go, Tommy Platicus, yeah. Groundwater contains minerals. Over time, dissolved minerals can harden after filling in cavities in your skeleton. 
or the water can dissolve your skeleton, leaving only minerals in its place. Either way, your skeleton will turn to stone, and you'll be a fossil. Yep. Step four, wait to be exposed. As the years go by, if you're lucky, sea levels can fall or rock can erode and expose you. Then if your luck holds out, you might get spotted by a fossil hunter and wind up in a museum collection where scientists can study you to learn about evolution. That's the dream right there. Uh... Now, Trooper2112 wants to know, is it possible to find fossils on the ground of the sea? So on the sea floor, on the sea bottom. It's possible, I guess, but it's not likely. It's... There's a number of reasons why it's not likely. The first is that actual, like, ocean crust tends to be very young, and it gets recycled quickly. Um, here we go. Yeah, take a look at this here. Analyzing core samples and sonar readings from around the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, Hess made an astonishing discovery, a phenomenon almost beyond comprehension. The age of the Atlantic Ocean floor, he determined, was progressively older the further it moved away from the ridge. Harry Hess so this is like the mid-ocean ridge right here. So like the Hawaiian island chain is kind of along this mid-ocean ridge. That's why we've got these volcanic islands, is that the, these plates move apart from one another and they kind of come out from this central ridge. And you've got the, the most... The newest rock right here closest to the ridge. It's like a double conveyor belt kind of coming out from this central ridge like that. Hess had discovered that the seafloor was spreading. He concluded yep. that molten rock was being forced up from inside the earth at the ridge, where it then formed into new crust on the ocean floor. Yep. Gradually, it was pushed away on either side as more molten rock continued pushing up from behind it. Hess called his great discovery seafloor spreading. Pretty straightforward. Harry Hess was yeah. in a position that he could bring it all together. Things were spreading apart and new earth was being generated. But if you did this for long enough, the earth should grow. And it doesn't. The so, earth doesn't get any bigger. No. Harry appreciated the fact that yeah. if new earth... So what do you think happens? If, if you've got this new crust that's always coming out of this central ridge that's spreading outward, then shoot, chat, what do you think... What do you think happens to that rock if it doesn't mean that the earth is growing? Then what's happening to that rock once it reaches the continental crust? Anybody think they know? Hmm. Uh, we've got some correct answers here. Yes, indeed. Um, if you said something like, well, the crust goes under the continental crust, it subducts, subduction, then, uh, you are correct. Here, take a look. Earth was being generated in one area. They have to be consumed or recycled in another area. Yeah. The process that recycles the crust of the spreading ocean floor back inside the Earth is called subduction. Yep. Uh, I thought it was going to be longer than that. Um... Here, let's take a look at this. During World War Oh, that looks like a World War II fleet submarine. Either a Gato, Baleo, or maybe Tench class boat there. For two scientists at sea were using And that is the USS Nautilus. I think that's SS571, the world's first nuclear submarine. Sophisticated echo technology to track submarines when they turned up surprising information about the ocean floor. Yeah. There they found a stretch of underwater ridges made of continually erupting volcanoes. The mid-ocean ridges formed when molten rock rises from there you go, the Charlie's earth. Yeah. 
and then pushes the crust apart. There we go, apart. see? Like two conveyor belts coming out from a central spreading sea floor strong enough to move the continents. Yeah. Not only is new crust formed at mid-ocean ridges, but it dips back down again into the interior of the Earth. Yep. You put this all together, and what you get is plate tectonics. The idea that the Earth's crust can be broken up into large pieces or plates that consist yep. of both continents and also pieces of oceanic crust moving together over the face of the Earth. When two plates collide, sometimes one is pushed downward and melts into magma. Yep. There we go. Eventually, it subducts this red hot underneath. Material rises to the surface and explodes, creating a volcano. So that's why we have like our coastal mountain ranges here in California. Um here in the beautiful sunny San Francisco Bay Area. We've got the Marin Headlands right here, north of San Francisco. These are the result of that oceanic crust going and plunging underneath. So I guess it's it's coming this way. So it plunges underneath. And as that, that dense oceanic crust goes down, it melts. And that can that creates all of this like pressure, heat that, that pushes those coastal mountains up. So that's why we have these right here. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So new Red crust is born. Is fed, no expense. C underscore Ken gifted a tier one sub to Jenna Baby Girl 123. Thank you, thank you, C-Ken. I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you for the gift sub there. You're helping us with our sub goal. We're at 22 out of 150 now. Uh, ouch, ouch says, so the Earth is recycling itself all the time. Yes, and that is one of the reasons why it's... You're not going to find a lot of good fossils at the bottom of the ocean. It's because the rocks are not that old. They're like earliest Jurassic period at the very oldest. And those are going to be the rocks that are just, you know, plunging down underneath the continental plates at mid-ocean ridges and destroyed deep ocean trenches like a never-ending conveyor belt yep here let's hear that one more time because that's important Actually, this red hot material rises to the surface see and explodes creates these creating a volcano just like that so new crust is born at mid-ocean ridges and destroyed yep. at deep ocean trenches like so mid-ocean ridges are like the hawaiian island chain where you've got all this volcanic activity and then over here, the crust, oceanic crust, plunges beneath the continental crust. And that's what pushes up coastal mountain ranges. And explodes, yeah. creating a volcano. So new crust is born at mid-ocean ridges and destroyed... I know the Hawaiian ocean island ranges. chain is a hotspot. I'm kind like of oversimplifying here, Jody. Belt. We've got people in chat who've, like, never heard of this stuff before. And two plates simply nudging each other can cause catastrophic results. Yep, like when the San Andreas Fault slipped in 1906. There we go. Yeah. How fast do the plates move? If you live in the U.S., you're probably standing on the North American plate. Yep. In the course of one year, the ground under your feet will move about two inches. And over long periods of time, that's enough to reshape the Earth, build mountains, trigger earthquakes, and create volcanoes. Yep. So it's like somebody was just saying in chat, the Earth is almost like a living thing. You know, it doesn't fulfill all the criteria to be a living thing. It doesn't reproduce. I don't know if it respirates. But it does move and change. And that's important to recognize. Uh, and Alfred Wagner, anybody? Yeah, we had a whole stream about Alfred Wagner on the anniversary of his birth, Tea Time Cat. Um, I can find that for you in our, uh, on the YouTube page. Yeah. Until it was later rediscovered. It is today one of the best accepted ideas in science and most well supported. We'll talk about why, and we'll talk about why it took so long to catch on. Plate tectonics, yeah. It's going to be a fun stream. Here's well, a link. Before we go to that, let's say hello to everybody in chat. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. 
Um, Nova Ninja wants to know, what was the first human-like creature exploring the Earth? It depends what you mean by human-like, and it depends what you mean by exploring. And Crybuckets there is uh, excited for the stream. <laughs> Welcome to Paleontologizing. Thank you for the follow. Um, yeah, so... Human beings first evolved in Africa. And our ancestors have lived there for a long, long time. Leading up to us today. Um, and so... When you say exploring the Earth, Nova Ninja... Uh, human ancestors were confined to Africa until later... Modern humans evolved. So human ancestors didn't... If we're talking about, like, hominid human ancestors, they were restricted to Africa. Um, it's only after humans had been around for a while, actually, that we left Africa. Uh, yeah. I am not a paleoanthropologist, so this is a little bit outside of my realm of expertise. So it depends on which one you want to call human-like first. You know? We've got the Australopiths, we've got Homo habilis, and then you move into Homo erectus, Neanderthalus, Homo sapiens. There's some interbreeding between Homo neanderthalus and Homo sapiens. Um, it's it's complicated and interesting, and it's I'm I'm a little bit wary about talking about this in depth because this is not my specialty. I'm a dinosaur guy. The dinosaurs are what I actually study, what I work on, what I publish on. But yeah, yeah. Oh, when the first human walked the earth. Oh, so Nova Ninja, that would have been not that long ago. Like, less than a million years ago. Um, here. Let me see if I can find... Um, here we go. This will work. Let's take a look at this video here. What in the world? Yeah. Of years old. I'm standing next to some mountains that are millions of years old. And the Earth is itself four and a half billion years old. Yep. How do I even wrap my mind around that length of time? It's it's tricky. That's a good question. Good question. It, it's it's tricky for normal mortal human beings to wrap our minds around the idea of like deep time like that, to use a phrase that I don't really like that much. It's... There's a lot of time. The history of the Earth is pretty long. About four and a half billion years long. So how do you start to understand that and gain, like, the proper perspective on it? They use a cool analogy here with a sporting sports field. We call it a football field here in the States. American football is different from football throughout the rest of the world, but yeah, you'll see. How can you imagine 4.5 billion years? And how does yeah. that compare to the amount of time that humans have been around? A geologist gave us the idea to use a football field as a metaphor, and that's exactly what we're going to do. It works at pretty this well, end zone, I we've got the present, and at this end zone is the moment our planet formed. Earth's entire no, history momentum, stretches the full hundred yards in between. Can you hear this? It sounds a little Every quiet. Every inch is 1.3 million years. Okay. Let's start at the beginning and take a walk through Earth's entire history. Yeah. For the first few hundred million years, the Earth was bombarded by rocks from outer space. But now it's starting to calm down. And way up here, 3.8 billion years ago, life begins. Yep. We're talking simple life. Single cells floating in a vast ocean. Now these cells are figuring out new ways to get energy. They're evolving to harness the power of the sun. Photosynthesis starts past the 20 yard line. 
The air here is mostly carbon dioxide and nitrogen, but right around here, little green cells start making oxygen. And uh, Murph says both footballs are played on the same length of pitch slash field. Really? Because it's it's a hundred yards in American football. Is uh, is a football field and the rest of the world is it less than a hundred meters? Because a hundred meters is longer than a hundred yards. Um, the width of the field is different. Interesting, Murph. Okay. Okay. That's it. I would kind of expect, uh, uh, what we would call a soccer field here in the States, but what other people would call a football pitch in other parts of the world. I would expect that to be 100 meters, but it's 90 to 120 meters. Interesting, Le Petit Prince Encore. It varies. I did not know that. Well, it shows what I know about, about sports. Interesting. Yeah. And TMK says, does it not have to be oxygen before there can be a living cell? No. So the first living things that we had on Earth did not breathe oxygen. There is kind of a big turnover event that we call the Great Oxygenation Event, where certain critters that were photosynthetic, little microscopic organisms, they started producing oxygen, which was toxic to other creatures. And so a lot of those other creatures would have died out, but it would have taken like tens of millions of years so it's not like it happened overnight or anything yeah the great rusting there you go murph yeah yeah and up here about 2.3 yeah. billion years ago oxygen starts building up in the atmosphere there we go we're halfway yeah. down the field and we just got the kind of atmosphere that humans can breathe yep for the next billion and a half years it's paradise so, uh nova ninja i hope this is this is interesting so far and i hope i hope this is useful it's going to be a while until we get to humans we are at the very, very, very end of this. Let's take a look. For single cells of every variety. But as we move down the field, cells start working together. And by the time we reach the 18-yard line right here, there's lots of complex critters floating around. It's 800 million years before the present, and things are about to get really interesting. Here at the 13-yard line, we've got an ozone layer. Nice. And here, a sudden explosion of diversity. The Cambrian Fungi, explosion. Sea anemones. Yeah. Mollusks. 530 million years ago, animals take their first steps on land. In the ocean, fish appear. Land plants, insects, sharks, amphibians. It's been four... And those are not true sharks like we think of today. They're not our modern groups of sharks, but they are chondrichthian fishes with jaws. Um even if we wouldn't like recognize them as modern sharks. A billion years since yeah. we started, and here at the five yard line, we're just starting to see the first mammals and dinosaurs. We see Stegosaurus dinosaurs right here about 176 million years ago, but we don't see the T-Rex until about four and a half feet from the end zone, about 68 yep. million years ago. It's a weird looking Look, T-Rex model. The T-Rex is closer to us in the present than it is to the Stegosaurus way back there. Yeah, that's true. Oh, and there's a catastrophe at the one yard line. 66 million years ago, a meteor or volcanoes or climate change or all asteroid killed 75% yeah. of all species. But life rallies. This yard is the yard of mammals. We've got <laughs> armadillos, yep. giant whales, wolves, and here a foot away, the great apes, our family. <laughs> Hippos, <laughs> mammoths, lions. Lucy, almost human, but not quite. Saber-toothed tigers, cattle. Then 200,000 years ago, this is where there we, we find go. humans that look like us. So just right there. That's just practically on the line. From the end zone, the width of this light bulb. Yeah. This is all of human experience, but everything we call civilization, agriculture, cities, books, science, these don't appear until we're two hairs breadth from the end zone the width yeah. of this filament. <laughs> really puts things into perspective, right? Pretty cool. Pretty cool. So in the grand scheme of things, dinosaurs didn't live that long ago when we're talking about the history of life on Earth, you know? Life starts about 3.8 billion years ago. And dinosaurs are right here in the home stretch. We as humans are, it, it's almost like we don't even exist. So incredibly recent. Brightness says, this is so cool. Thanks. I'm glad you like this. Welcome, Brightness. Welcome to Paleontologizing.
Yeah. Um, so Nova Ninja, I hope I hope that explains some things for you. We just want to yeah. say thanks to the Morgan State Bears for letting us do all this weird stuff on their football. Field. There's a link right there for you. We say send Good us video. your questions. We'll answer them every other Tuesday. Good stuff. Neat. So yeah, yeah, we're a paint chip with. There you go, Jody Fish. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Starling Fan says, "What do we? Why is the we in quotation marks? What do we think is the absolute oldest fossil?" That's a great question too. Um. And Murph, thank you for gifting brightness there. I appreciate that. I appreciate that, Murph, and I'm sure brightness does too. Thank you for your generosity, as as always, Murph. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Let's see. Trying to find which one of these is going to be best for our purposes. This is going to be pretty okay. From seven years ago, from SciShow. Yeah. There's a lot we know about the Earth's history. We know that it's about 4.6 billion years old. We know that it formed yep. from things like asteroids and comets crashing into each other. But one thing we don't know about hey, delightful the planet, Dilophosaurus. Exactly oh, if you were here yesterday, delightful Dilophosaurus. You would have seen this. Here. Is this updated? It is. Good. Yeah. Full size Dilophosaurus skull, 3D printed on the wall with a Skeletosaurus skull behind it there. Or in the jaws, I suppose. Anyway, it's good to have you here, delightful Dilophosaurus. Welcome, welcome. Picked up. So, uh... Yeah. Anyway, good to have you here. Oh, you did see that. Excellent. Well, it's good to have you here. Welcome back. Fantastic. Here, let's talk about what are the oldest fossils that we have thus far. When life first evolved. Until now, yeah. our earliest fossils showed that there were microbes around 3.5 billion years ago. But this week, a team of scientists are reporting in Nature that they found even older fossils, breaking the previous Where record by two... Spent? No expense. And thank you, Charlie's Dragon, gifted three months for gifting Dilop delightful, delightful, delightful Dilophosaurus. They've gifted 23 months in the channel. I appreciate that very much, Charlie's Dragon. Thank you, thank you for your generosity there. Um, excellent. Yeah. Um. And, oh, cool, Salamander. Well, let's take a look at that. 200 when this is million done. Yeah. years. A lot yeah. of the debate around when... Murph says microbial fossils must be hard to spot. Yeah, you can't really see them with the naked eye sometimes you've got to just take rock samples that are of the right age and look at them in the laboratory and see if you can find any trace of of life on them or in them i suppose when life first appeared yeah. it has to do with something that happened around 3.8 billion years ago earth was pelted by asteroids and comets in a period called the late heavy bombardment there are tiny yeah. crystals in ancient rocks in australia that contain traces of carbon from 4.1 billion years ago before the late heavy bombardment which might have been left there by very basic life so it's possible that hmm. life first showed up more than 4 billion years ago but it would have been hard for early life to survive with all that stuff crashing into earth which is why a lot of scientists think that it yeah. must have happened happened after the late heavy bombardment. So those 3.5 billion year old fossils supported this idea since they'd have had time to evolve after the bombardment was over. The fossils are- Um, oh, Paleo Ken says, when you were talking with Ethan, when you had him on and you talked about Jim's definition of what a paleontologist is, what was the name of that belief around you are what you do? Oh, shoot. Um, he's looking for like a philosophical term. Uh, what would that be? It's not the purpose of the thing is what it does. There's a name for that, too. Um, it's... Oh, uh, a... Wait, were you talking about descriptive versus prescriptive definitions? Or... I'm not sure, Ken. I'm not sure. Shoot, I've got... I'm wondering about this now, too. Yeah. Uh, Nova Ninja says, I'm in the UK, but I'm going to stay in this stream all night. Nova Ninja, do get some sleep if you need to. Don't let me keep you up. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I say we because we aren't all paleontologists. Oh, fair enough, Starling fan. Yeah, but you're here. You could say, 
you could say we to mean, you know, people interested in natural history, people interested in fossils. That's fair. Yeah. Um. Anyway, yeah. Let's continue. They're called stromatolites, and they're made up of layers of sediment formed by growing mats of bacteria. Layers yeah. of sediment can also just build up over time, but the shape and chemical signatures in a stromatolite can reveal that it was formed by microbes. So we know that really life cool was fossils. around at least 3.5 billion years ago thanks to these fossils. Tyrannosaurus, ancient predecessor of the Tyrannosaurus. Verminatide duck. Mighty of the Jurassic Age. Giant meat eater with long dagger-like teeth. Pope Thank you for the... For the five months of support, I really appreciate that for minute tide. Thank you, thank you. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. now there's evidence that microbes were around even earlier. In a paper published this week, Australian researchers found signs of stromatolites in 3.7 billion year old rocks in Greenland, Holy some of cow. the oldest rocks anywhere on Earth. These older rocks are metasedimentary rocks, which means they're sedimentary rocks that have been changed by heat and pressure. The shape and texture of certain layers in the rocks, plus their chemical composition, are clues that there are stromatolites made by microbes inside the rocks. So these could be the oldest fossils ever found and at 3.7 billion years old, they were formed around 100 million years after the late heavy bombardment. And that's a bit of a problem for the whole life evolved after the bombardment idea. 100 million years isn't much time for simple life to get as complex as the bacteria that would have formed these mats, which means that life might have begun before the asteroid pelting ended. The researchers suggest that some life could have developed even earlier and survived through the chaos of the late heavy bombardment. So maybe hmm. early life on Earth was even tougher than we expected. Expected. So we or still have a lot more to learn about the history of yeah. our planet, but some things have always been around affecting how everything in our universe interacts. The four fundamental forces of nature. There's the yeah. strong interaction. The anyway, if you want to find out what the rest of these are, here is a link right there. Um, I just got a text message from, from Ethan. Clear some of these tabs out here. There we go. But uh, some more of those items from the wish list for our field work this, this summer have been arriving at his apartment. He says stream killed it yesterday. He's very happy. Here is Java the cat enjoying one of the boxes that some of the items arrived in. And she is just loving this. Holy cow, it's like a new box every day. And look, a water barrel for her, too. <laughs> I guess she was just about to jump down from here. She's moving around all excited. But, uh, yeah. Uh, from Ethan and from myself, thank you, thank you, everybody who's contributed to our field work this summer by purchasing items off the wish list. That is huge. And, uh, holy cow, this one just went up and it's already been, oh no, did you details? I thought it had been purchased, but I guess not. Or maybe it has been. Um, good stuff. We are supremely excited about all of this. Oh, and look, the Plockman's Mustard is up there now. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, each and every one of these items we'll be using to dig up new species of dinosaur in the almond formation of southwest Wyoming this summer. And many of these items, like uh, Ethan and Jim and Don call this McLeod? What do they call it here? Garden something. Um, this geopaleo pick right here? You know, tools like this, this pick right there. These tools are probably going to outlive us. We're using tools like this that have been around for 30 or 40 years in a lot of cases. I've used picks and shovels that have been around since the, you know, since the 1950s on some dig crews that I've been on. And uh, with these more modern materials, you know, they last a lot longer, so. Um... 
Yeah. It's cool to think that, like, items that, that people are purchasing here are gonna be used for years and years and years into the future, and we'll be able to use them this summer to dig up some of these new dinosaurs in the almond formation. Yeah. Bought the pick yesterday? Thank you, Miss Abet. Yeah, I think that was a different pick, right? Or some of these, there's multiple of them that we need. So three of five of these ones have been purchased already, which is fantastic. Two of these three have already been purchased, which is excellent. Um, yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, those E322Ps are going to be around for decades. You're talking about the Estwing picks, right, Jody Fish? Yeah. And... Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Anyway, I just wanted to share that real quick. Yeah, I've got an S-Wing Supreme... Uh... Was it an E3-12P? Chisel Edge 12-ounce rock hammer. Um, that I've been... I got it for my 12th birthday. Very proud of that. Um, uh, and Ethan says, The kitchen tent arrived! He says, Boy, is it beefy. I felt bad for the delivery driver. Oh, boy. But, uh... So, oh, uh, hopefully... That means it's sturdy enough for a Wyoming storm. And then... Yeah. Uh, those exact ratchet straps, but they broke when we pulled a tree over with them. Whoops, says Mom and Dust. Well, we're hopefully not going to be doing any of that, but we might be pulling some dinosaurs around with them, so we'll see. We will see. Um, yeah. And Salamander. Oh, nice, nice. Okay. I will take that under advisement. Thank you, Salamander. I guess the other ones are out of stock right now? Huh. They'll probably pop back up again, though. No extra rope on the list. Does it not get used? We use a lot of ratchet straps. We don't use a whole lot of rope. Um, I use rope for stuff in the field, but I've got my own. Um, and I think we might even have some leftover from last year anyway. Some good nylon rope. Um, Charlie's Dragon says, since before Jim started digging dinosaurs? Well, Jim Kirkland has been digging dinosaurs since... Since the 1970s. I think 1973 is when he started. Um, because he's, yeah, last year was his, uh, his fieldwork anniversary. Last year he'd been digging dinosaurs out on the Colorado Plateau for 50 years. So that would be 1973. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, and oh, very cool. I thought this was going to be a video, but this is really neat. Salamander, yeah, Stegosaurus, lovely. I would have made the plates much more brightly colored, but you know, that's me. Interesting texture to those plates there. It's... The detail is really nice, and it's certainly pretty, but I I would definitely make some changes to this. Where's the, the throat ossicles, for one? It seems kind of old-fashioned in some way. Um... Yeah... Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Anyway. 
does Ethan still have anywhere to crash? Gogonite, he might be sleeping on a mound of, uh, of field equipment, you know? No, I'm sure that there's... I'm sure if he needs to, he could bring... Uh... He could bring some of those items and maybe store them at the USGS or something like that if he really needed to. Yeah. Anyway. Neat stuff. This has just popped up today. Let me see if I can find a better video of it. The Yale Peabody Museum has just reopened as of yesterday or today, I think. Yeah. Here, we'll start off with a little bit of a refresher here. I've been coming here since I was about five years old, and I walked through the door down the hall there and seeing uh, an animal that size. So I can see that my uh, 50,000 a year has been well spent. Andre Ukma, thank you so much for the tier three sub there. Holy moly, do I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you for that level of support. That is incredible. Thank you for supporting science outreach here on Twitch. That is, I really appreciate that. You're helping me continue to do this full time and that means a lot to me. It really does. Thank you, thank you. And enjoy all those emotes that you'll have access to now. You get the Sinusoropteryx ones at tier three and those ones too. Um, I don't know if that, sure that doesn't make it worth it. It's your, you did this out of the, the kindness of your heart, and I appreciate that. Holy cow. Appreciate you very much. Here, let's... Let's talk about the Yale Peabody Museum. This is a, a really important museum for the history of dinosaur paleontology. They've got a lot of specimens that originally were in the collections of Othniel Charles Marsh. Like, his crews collected these. A lot of them are holotypes. And uh, it's, a, it's a lovely historical collections. And it was recently under renovation. It was closed for a couple years, I think, as they were renovating it. Let's take a look. I've been coming here since I was about five years old, and I walked through the door down the hall there and seeing uh, an animal that size, it really had a huge effect on me. And I know that's true for many people. going on vacation in Canada. Lucky them. <laughs> there aren't a lot of yeah. organizations that have the talent and capacity to do this kind of work. These mounts that we're taking care of are both scientifically really valuable, but also historically important. And so taking them apart has to be done really carefully by people who absolutely know what to expect. And because RCI has worked on so many projects like this, uh, they're just total pros about it. Yeah. They really are. Okay, that's it. Some of the best in the world. Each Probably the best in the world. Comes Research apart casting slightly different. There's a lot of similarities between this and other ones we've done, but every time we always find something new. <laughs> or something else holding it. One of the new things is everything's plastered together here. Um, and it doesn't mean yeah. it hasn't happened in the past, but they're really plastered together. It makes it a little oh, yeah. bit more difficult because you have to be careful when you separate it off the steel. You try and chip the plaster and it, you have to do it without breaking bone. It's not just the size or the number of the fossils, it's the fact that they also get the artistry that's involved here too because you're having to think about how you make something that's been dead for 150 million years look like it's alive. This hall will look quite different when it reopens. The mounts overall will, will be much more lifelike. They'll represent behavior in a way that they haven't in the past. So I think it'll be uh, this is just real. Like That's why we're watching this. It's like a little refresher. In the big picture, this project is happening because museums like the Peabody remain really important. This is where scientists get together to tell stories to the wider world. And that's never been more important than it is now. Oh, cool. That's what it's about. Okay. And so this is a chance for us to I've never met update all yeah. of that and get it right. Hmm. Cool. 
So, it's just reopened. Let's have ourselves a look here. After closing its doors for renovation four years ago, the four Yale years ago. Peabody Museum in Connecticut is finally reopening. With over <laughs> 2,000 items from their collection on display, from fossils to early civilization technology and ancient Egyptian objects, the museum's undeniable centerpiece, a special find at 75 feet long, 6 feet wide, and 16 feet tall. This fossil helped reshape what we think about prehistory. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. Discovered during a Wyoming dig in 1879, this relic was named Brontosaurus excelsus by O.C. Marsh, the yep. first professor of paleontology in the U.S. and the museum's earliest director. What have you guys learned mm -hmm. that wasn't known then? Yeah. Wait, Lots they got Al Roker for this? That's, that's actually pretty cool. Um, I like to see that this has such a high profile, you know? That's, that's heartening to see. You know, dinosaurs, they bring the attention, you know? Um, cool stuff. Anyway, we were talking about O.C. Marsh on the anniversary of his death last week. He didn't die last week. He died in 1899. But, uh, yeah, not only was he the first professor of paleontology in United States history, it was also because of him that the Peabody Museum was built, basically. Or at least the, you know, the fossil hall there. Because his uncle, George Peabody, uh, forked over all the cash for that. So, yeah. Marsh was very, very lucky to have this wealthy uncle. Um, who basically like subsidized his entire career it's uh it's interesting stuff yeah yeah director what have you guys learned and a diagonal wasn't known i got a package yeah. for me today lots of things in Glad 2020 preservation experts we'll and open that in a minute. took down the 150 million year old brontosaurus on view since the 1930s current museum director david skelly says the goal was to remount it in a position now believed to be much more accurate. This yeah. animal is depicted here in the fossil mound as being really active. Its tail is swinging around. Its neck is straight out from the body. It was an herbivore, but it would have been a formidable animal. We now know this oh, yeah. is warm blood. Holy cow. And we now know that these bones can tell you what the metabolism of this animal was like. How much of this is actual fossil? It's about 80% real fossilized bone mm -hmm. and on the tail you can actually tell if you look up at the vertebrae uh -huh. you can see those y-shaped uh steel armatures mm -hmm. and see how they stand extend back and then yeah. they stop there's a pin going into the vertebrae farther back mm -hmm. you'd never do that to real bone right. so that's that's resin <laughs> this is rudy zallinger's age of reptiles mural yeah. It was painted between 1943 and 1947, and perhaps most importantly for me, and maybe for you, these illustrations were included in the Golden Book of Dinosaurs. The Golden Book of Dinosaurs. Which, before the internet, that's how you learned about dinosaurs, if you were... Yeah. Kid. I had to get myself a copy of that, actually. Nature, you think old. That's right. But we're in a new era now. We are in a new era. You couldn't really, yeah, me too, Ken. And we are leaning <laughs> into the idea that these exhibits will turn over as we learn more. I've been coming to this museum my whole life. When we took those exhibits down in 2020, there were exhibits that I remember from when I was five years old that were unchanged. That can't happen. Make no yeah. bones about Shoot. it. There's much to explore here. <laughs> Susan Butts is the director of collections and research, giving me a special hands-on introduction to discoveries in storage. Are they going to yeah, see Deinonychus? It has 14 million objects in its collection, ranging from 4.6 billion year old meteorites to plants that were collected in the Andes a couple months ago. And so what we've tried to do when we work on the collections is tell little stories that help you understand a big concept like evolution. This one is only about 66 million years old. And what is this? Not only is it a T-Rex tooth, it is the first one that was ever found. Really? This is a Patasaurus. <laughs> this was on our old Brontosaurus. The Brontosaurus yeah, has had thing. three skulls uh -huh. over its history. Something that we work on as scientists is trying to improve what people have done in the past mm -hmm. and get a better understanding. Do you sometimes just marvel at what you get to do? 
Absolutely. I get to see amazing material that most people never get to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, doing... shoot, that's a... That looks like a big toe claw of a sauropod dinosaur. Right there, yeah. You see that big blood groove right there? So this would be... Or it could, it could be a thumb claw, but it looks to me more like a, like a pedal ungual. One of the toe claws. We're doing as much yeah. as we can now to get that material out to the public. AC fix, very nice, Murph. Cool. What do you you're nice want and cool. this next generation to come away with when they've passed through the Peabody? I want people to have those moments coming into our galleries where they're just floored. Dinonychus. Now, yeah. just one more thing to do before my day at the museum comes to an end. My Brontosaurus! My Brontosaurus! And you know what that means, right? Brontosaurus? No. Thunder lizard. Whoa! It's my people! That's right. Thunder lizard! <laughs> Oh, it was great. meant to be. Yes, oh, the cool. Thunder Lizard and the Yale Peabody Museum opens up today. So it is cool. free to the public. What else did you see? Very cool. You know, that is today, really, today. There, there's a, a March 26, 2024. That was written about that actually inspired Michael Crichton to Jurassic write Park. Jurassic Park. No way. Yeah. And so that, because of this exhibit, Oh, that's why we have the, all the Jurassic Park movies. So everybody at Universal, thanks. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and we thank them as yeah. well. Right. We also, we all, okay. Susan Butts showed me around, I mean, the, the incredible exhibits they have there, just amazing, including yeah. one that I thought was very fitting. I couldn't even touch it. We couldn't even pick it up. A 4,000-year-old yeah. Babylonian cookbook. What? Yeah, it was actually a. That's it. That it, it. That's it. That's the fossil. It's a cookbook, and it's, uh, they, they've actually deciphered it. It's it's like a. It's got a number of stew recipes. Has anybody ever tried to recreate? Yes, they have. Really? They actually have. Four thousand. They were using recipe. Really wow. Cool. Yeah. So it, it's really, really cool. neat. Wow. All right, that, that was, was really great. interesting. I want to try one of those. That's some classic yeah. cooking yeah, right? there. Cooking with cow. Well. Cooking with cow. <laughs> cooking with, cow. Grass, stew. Cooking with calosaurus. <laughs> little dandelion. How about a little boost? Anyway, yeah. Uh, let's see here. That, no, that's not it. Goodness, it won't give me the proper URL for it. Or I would share it with you. Let's look it up in our history. There we go. And there you are. So if you're anywhere on the eastern seaboard, especially near Connecticut, you can go visit the Yale Peabody Museum now, and it is free to the public. Which, with the size of the endowment that Yale University has, they should absolutely make it free to the public. So, I'm glad that it is. Um, it is uh, good stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's called an artifact. Exactly. Le Petit. Yeah. Archaeologists study artifacts. Paleontologists study fossils. That's, uh, that's a good way to remember. Um... But yeah, yeah. Wonder if we could get those stew recipes to Kanara. That <laughs> I wonder if she'd be interested in that Jody fish. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. And Le Petit, I'm not sure what you're talking about. What? Anyway. Yeah, I figure. Why don't we get back into that documentary that we were looking at yesterday as kind of a jumping off point for talking about paleontological fieldwork. There we go. Uh, oh, Claytel. Oh, I gotcha, Le Petit. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, we, uh, we were watching this yesterday. Let me just start from the beginning to show you the opening sequence for anybody who's new here so that uh, you're on board with us. Uh. The world's top paleontologists dig into Canada's prehistoric past to unearth a living world buried in time. I love this because it's a... We got dinosaurs. Like a reality show. Heat and floods and about clock as they Mesozoic the field paleontology. It's cool stuff. And the most incredible creatures ever to walk the earth will live again. It's... On Dino Hunt. Yeah. It's a little bit flattering, I gotta say, that, like, television executives think that 
you know, our line of work as paleontologists is interesting enough to make a TV show out of. That's that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Uh, anyway, let's get back to where we were here yesterday. Yeah. So this here is probably the most important fossil. Yeah, America's got fossils. In this case, Canada. Canada's got fossils. And it, but yeah. <laughs> it reminds me of... Uh, this is much better than... than some of your more ridiculous reality shows. <laughs> like, America's kids got singing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, there we go. <laughs> uh, you've been voted off the dig sites this weird adult yeah um <laughs> a skull bit. anyway there have been some crazy reality shows in the past this thankfully is not one of them um again we're watching this because i think it's going to be a great kind of jumping off point for talking about paleontological field work and what we're going to be doing this summer streaming live on twitch but we collected all season yeah. anyway this is the center point of the skull the midline and then on this side of the midline you can see there's a spike or hook coming off forward and you can see it even better on the other side so you've got the two hooks coming off one either side they're about the size yep. of your hand that's going to be an animal a lot like centrosaurus right here excuse me big ceratopsian dinosaur that's one of the most important bones. Yeah, that's a nice centrosaurus there. So a ceratopsian, a member of the horned dinosaur family. Uh, a relative of triceratops. Although triceratops is a chasmosaurine, a cent uh, chasmosaurine ceratopsid. And centrosaurus is a centrosaurine ceratopsid. There's kind of two different, two different groups. Um... There we go. Um, yeah, Chasmosaurians and Centrosaurians. That kind of works, but that's also confusing because they're showing a three horned one there. Within minutes, all right. We're finding fossils. And F Cap to Bonte, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. Look at all those chickens! And Boom Cow, thank you for the follow, too. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Anyway, a lot of people, when I show them this image, they're kind of surprised that we have so many Ceratopsians, and so many horned dinosaurs nowadays. But this is only a fraction of the ones that we uh, we know about nowadays. There are even more than this. It might be a large fraction, but it's still just a fraction. Um, everybody knows Triceratops. Some people know Styracosaurus. Some people even know Diabloceratops. Uh, I'm gonna be working with the guy who discovered and dug up Diabloceratops again this summer. Dawn to Blue. Anyway, there's a bunch of different Ceratopsians. Most of these are from North America, but a handful of them are from Asia, like Protoceratops here, like uh, Turanoceratops, if that one's on here too, Udanoceratops. But the vast majority of these are from either the US or from Canada. 
Yeah. And Murph says three, four, and five who have the plates on the face. Did they have a keratin horn? Oh, you're talking about Pachyrhinosaurus here. We don't really know if they did have a keratin horn. That is one idea. And I get that question a lot, Murph. It's funny, people are interested in that. Um, Pachyrhinosaurus, keratin horn, here we go. So this is how the animal is usually portrayed, with what we call a big nasal boss, just like a big lump on the snout, but there is chance these animals, that that nasal boss actually supported a keratinous horn, like on a rhinoceros. Uh, we don't really know. But like a rhinoceros skull. Um, there we go. It just looks like that. The horn doesn't really fossilize. You've just got this big lump of bone there that's got this scraggly texture to it really wrinkly, kind of rough texture to that there. Yeah, and that is an attachment point for the horn, which is made of keratin. Keratin is the same material as like your fingernails. Yeah. So there is a chance that maybe Pachyrhinosaurus worked the same way. Maybe it did actually have a big keratin horn there. That would make it different from pretty much all the other ceratopsian dinosaurs uh, whose horns actually had a bony core to them. But maybe these guys grew that and then lost it after the breeding season or something. It's it's possible. We really don't know. Or maybe it was just a really brightly colored lump of keratin or something instead, instead of a horn. We're really not sure what this critter looked like in life. Um... It would be really neat to see somebody test that hypothesis in a rigorous way that, oh, maybe this was like an anchor point for a big keratin horn. I'm not sure how you go about testing that, but it's something I'd be very interested to see the results of, you know? Just look at that. That is nuts. And maybe these animals, like Garnastuda says, maybe this would have been kind of like an antler, because antlers get shed every year. Antlers are on cervid mammals, on, you know, critters from the deer family. And basically the point of those antlers is to just get super, super big as like a, a flashy advertisement. The males can say, hey, look at me, I am so good. I am so good at finding enough food to eat and surviving that I can afford to just waste all of these calories on these big stupid antlers. You know, come have, come have offspring with me. I got good genes. That's the the idea behind that. You know. So yeah, yeah. Um, man, Jody Fish says comparative skeletal physiology to say rhinoceros versus giraffe head nubs. Yeah, those are called um, ossicones on a giraffe. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, we don't have any evidence that dinosaurs had antlers, Garnastuda, but maybe this would have been something close, potentially. Um, but we don't know. We don't know if these animals had this, because all that's preserved is the skull. So Nova Ninja says, is that real? I mean, Pachyrhinosaurus is very much real. But... Again, they just have this... kind of lump over their nose. We don't know if that supported, like, a soft tissue horn, like a keratin horn or not. We, uh... We really don't know. It's a neat idea that it did, but that's a hard one to test. Merce says, is keratin lighter than bone? Yes. It, it often is. Could it have been for weight saving if it was large? Potentially, Murph, yeah. Potentially. Um, and Jody Fish says, but the difference in how they're actually attached to the skull would possibly show similarities to one or the other. Yeah, if you could compare the the morphology and texture of a Pachyrhinosaurus nasal boss to a Rhinoceros nasal boss. Then yeah, that could be that could be instructive. Could be instructive. But for right now, our idea of what Pachyrhinosaurus looked like, if you're gonna be 
really reasonable about it. We think they probably looked like this. You know? Yeah. But they could have had a big horn that just doesn't get fossilized. Yeah. It's possible. And Trooper says, the plates on a Stegosaurus, are those keratin or bone? Bone. Yeah. So that's the thing, is... Is that the bony plates on a Stegosaurus are bone. They would have had a keratin sheath over the top of them. But... Yeah, so in life, the plates may have been twice as long. Because this is just a bony core there. It's kind of like how claws have got a bony core to them, and then they have a keratin sheath over the top to make them longer and pointier. And so, yeah. These are what we call osteoderms on Stegosaurus. Osteoderm, that means like bone in the skin. It's just like a bone that's floating there in the skin, anchored to the rest of the skeleton just via soft tissue. So it's definitely got a bony core, but how big was the keratin sheath over the top of that? We don't really know. Yeah. And you understand? Great, Trooper. Great. Yeah. Anyway. Let's continue. I would not be surprised at all if this piece right here actually attached to... Uh, the other sections of frill that we have in the lab and actually gave us a complete picture of a single individual frill for this this new species. Nice. So they had more pieces of the same individual. If the frill from pieces a, match, a, a David Evans team. will have discovered a brand new species of Ceratopsian uh. dinosaur. And okay, try it now, says do armadillos have osteoderms? They I think they do. Yeah, I know glyptodonts did. I've got some glyptodont osteoderms, some 3D printed ones. Um, and I think glyptodonts are, are thought to be from the same family. So yeah, there's an armadillo skeleton. And I think, I think those are actually bone. I don't think they're just keratin. But let's find out. Um, nine banded armadillo. There we go. That's, of course, what these critters look like in life. Yeah. Um, in penguins, penguins, it's just keratin, it's not bone. Penguins are not close relatives to armadillos. Let's see. Diet, behavior, predation, reproduction. Uber hog. Yeah. Um. The word osteoderm does not appear. The outer shell is composed of ossified dermal scutes. So they did turn to bone. They are osteoderms. They just don't use the term osteoderm in this uh, in this article. Covered by non-overlapping keratinized epidermal scales, which are connected by flexible bands of skin. So they've got both bone and keratin covering it. So yeah, this is bony armor covered in keratin. Cool. And okay, try it now. So, so a fingernail on a person is not an osteoderm because it is keratin. Exactly. Okay, try it now. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to say a crocodile um, a crocodile skeleton if you're gonna have the whole skeleton you need the osteoderms too where's the is their part they're they're literally bone there we go so that is I reckon I just saw this last summer this is the dinosuchus mount it's like a giant alligator id from the late Cretaceous of North America the suckers like 25 30 feet long it's like, it's like nine meters long. And you can see along the back, up there, you've got those rows of bony scutes. Those are called osteoderms. Um, 
Because they're literally bits of bone in there. Crocodile skeleton osteoderms. There we go. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, um. I'm trying to find you a decent sized image here. That's tricky. They look like this. They've got a very distinctive texture. When you find them in the field, they are unmistakable. It's like, that is, yep, that is definitely a crocodilian skewed. Got this unmistakable texture. And skewed is S-C-U-T-E. It's like cute with an S in front. And you know what? They are pretty cute. Yeah. Uh, but these are another example of osteoderms. The armor within the skin of crocodiles. Yeah. Cool stuff. Osteoderm means bone skin. Exactly. Gritus Bucca. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a lovely one, if only it were larger. But yeah. There you go. All these armor scutes. Osteoderms. There. Yeah. Yeah. And Dorkolotl. Holy cow. Um... I might extend the season a bit, but I'm most likely want to be able to come back until the fall. Nice pieces today, though. Picks in the Discord. Nice! Very, very cool, Dorkolotl. I'm so happy for you. That's so awesome that you're... Not only that you're going out and doing field work, digging up fossils, but also, like, sharing it with other people in the community is really cool, Dorkolotl. Um, you're an inspiration. Appreciate you. Uh, did you ever find any, uh, any croc scutes? Or maybe more like the alligator scutes? In your work out there in, uh, in Florida, Dorkolotl? Um. I'm guessing you'd have a bunch there. They are always super distinctive looking. That texture. Yeah. Um, not Fenny scutes myself, but other volunteers have. Nice. Yeah, they've gotta be pretty common. These animals have got a lot of them, so when they die, the pieces just kind of scatter all over the place. You know, because that's... You've got dozens, if not hundreds, of skewts per individual animal. And in life, you know, they look like this. These armor plates like that are actually made of bone, which is super cool. Yeah. Uh, Nova Ninja says, can anyone go on a dig? Maybe not anyone, but uh, if you're, if you've got the ability to get out there to a fossil site and you've got the physical ability to, you know, be down on the ground all day on hands and knees oftentimes, then yeah, yeah. There are a bunch of different paleontological crews across the US and around the world who need volunteers in order to be able to operate. So, uh, something to consider. If you ever dreamed of, of going out and digging up fossils, it's, uh, there are museums that, that could really use your help. Um, and Dorkolotl says, I think the real paleontologists are describing a new croc gator, I don't know, from the site. It says, if that says anything about how much we've found there, very cool, Dorkolotl, very, very cool. Yeah. Uh, and Will of the Winds, nobody's asked about the Deccan Traps yet today. Why? They're not erupting again, are they? Just kidding. Um, but no, Will of the Winds, no. We were talking about the Siberian Traps briefly yesterday. Yeah. Uh, can I go on a dig with you, for example? So, not with me, Nova Ninja, but... Um, there are definitely other paleontological crews across the country who... You know... Would, uh, would be looking for volunteers. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. And a Chris Gesocked video came out about them today. Oh, interesting, Will of the Winds. Somebody was mentioning that. Um, maybe we'll take a look at that. I have sometimes kind of mixed feelings about Chris Gesocked. But...
let's see. How the dinosaurs actually died. Not like that. What? Huh. Let's take a look at this. I wonder if this is going to be the volcanism hypothesis that they're that they're claiming here. If it is, that's going to be interesting because it's this is that would be running counter to the growing consensus, you know, the consensus that's been building in the paleontological community for decades at this point that it was an asteroid impact that actually kicked off the end of the age of dinosaurs. But let's let's take a look. A ruthless murder was committed. Someone killed the dinosaurs, and we... Now hang on. Was that a Ceratosaurus at the beginning? Or no, maybe that's supposed to be Majungasaurus. If it is, good on them. Yeah. A ruthless murder was committed. Someone killed the dinosaurs, and we have the murderer. Witnesses say that an Everest-sized asteroid hit Earth, devastated the planet, and caused a mass extinction. A simple, fascinating, and convincing explanation. Or is it? In the last few years, new evidence has re- Mama M Media, how are you doing? Arrived with two raiders. Welcome to Paleontologizing, Mama M Media. How did your stream go? I hope it was good. Welcome back. Thanks for being here. You were playing something called Death Stranding. Oh, that sounds like Sounds like a bad time if you're a whale. Um, or any other kind of marine mammal. Or marine reptile. Shoot. Anyway, I hope you had a good time, Mama M Media. I hope you survived the Death Stranding. Uh, thanks for being here. Here we go. A simple, fascinating, and convincing explanation. And Redispi, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. In the last few years, new evidence has reinvigorated an older theory pointing at a second suspect. A very slow and... Oh no, are they falling into this trap here? Oh boy. So this used to be kind of the default explanation. Is it like massive volcanism is what ended the reign of the dinosaurs? But I find that utterly unconvincing. And I guess this will be a good opportunity to talk about why. But, uh... Yeah, I don't know. You can probably see why I have very mixed feelings about this channel. Um, It's just, all, it's also so, like, middle of the road and, like... I don't know. It tries to be so inoffensive that it's actually, like, infuriating sometimes. Let's continue. Liquid asteroid, 1,000 times bigger, hitting Earth on the opposite side of the planet. Like the true crime channel we are, let's look at the new evidence and tell a different story that could change everything we thought we knew. The oh last boy. days of a kingdom. 66 million years ago. What's wrong with that poor sauropod's leg? It's bending the wrong way right there. Yeah, was a... Earth was barely recognizable. It was the last days of the Cretaceous, one of the hottest periods in Earth's history, and much more humid. Lush jungles and woodlands covered much of the planet. I think those are supposed to be Majungasaurus, which are from the Mistrichti, and they are from about 66 million years ago. Yeah. Majungasaurus. It does have a little hornlet thing on the top of its head. It's related to Carnotaurus. The other Abelosaurs like that. I think that's probably what they're going for, and if it is, then good on them, because this is an animal from the right time. Yeah. Majungasaurus. Yeah. Anyway, I think that's probably what they're going for there, and if it is... Nicely done. Even the polar regions were home to forests of prehistoric pines. Oh, cool. And ferns. Thank you, Dinosaur Dave. Amazing ecosystems that were robust enough to survive the many months of darkness during the polar night. Oversized animals were everywhere. Pterosaurs filled the skies. Marine lizards and long necked monsters are. Uh, you know what? To 50 These are meters. probably going to be some of the opalized critters that, uh. Yeah. 
that, um, that Dinosaur Dave is talking about. Let me take a look at those. Dinosaur Dave is in the midst of a cross-continent odyssey right now, going across Australia, and yeah, take a look at that. A plesiosaur, like I thought. And Redispi, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizer. It's good to have you here. Um, the Munosaurus, yeah. Yeah, look at those. Beautiful. Why does it look like it's inside of a shop, though? It's a little strange. These might be... No, they don't look like replica bones. They look like they're real opalized plesiosaur bones there. Interesting. Cool. But yeah, yeah. Um, neat stuff. Neat stuff. Thank you, Dinosaur Dave, for posting. Um, yeah. Then Ken says, I think the guy is just using stock dino, which Ceratosaurus is pretty stock. I, I don't know. It doesn't look like this is supposed to be a generic Ceratosaurus. I think they might actually be going for Majungasaurus here. Um... It's an opal shop in Adelaide. It's all real bones. They have a tiny mini museum. Oh, cool, Dinosaur Day. Huh. Yeah. Huh. I think these are supposed to be... Like a super stylized Majungasaurus. I'm going to have a little bit of faith in them here, Ken, that, that they at least got that right. Because Majungasaurus is... Or no, no, not, not Majungasaurus. It's, um... Rajasaurus is what I'm thinking of. Majungasaurus is... No, Majungasaurus is also Mastrichtian. It could also be Rajasaurus. Um... Rajasaurus is another Abelisaur. It's probably supposed to be Rajasaurus. Yeah. Rajasaurus is also from India. Where the, uh, the Deccan Traps are located. Here's the Rajasaurus from uh, Prehistoric Planet. I think it's probably supposed to be Rajasaurus. Yeah, here's one from Jurassic World the game, I guess. Looking really doofy there. I think that's probably supposed to be what this critter is, but I'm gonna give them uh gonna give them the benefit of the doubt here at least. Yeah. Of the planet. Even the yeah. polar regions were home to forests of prehistoric pines and ferns. Amazing ecosystems that were robust enough to survive the many months of darkness during the polar night. Because so far they're only showing the Strictian dinosaurs and pterosaurs. Pterosaurs filled the skies. Marine lizards and long-necked monsters up to 15 meters swam in the oceans. And on land, basically everything larger than one meter was a dinosaur. That's not a good Triceratops. One of the most successful animals ever to walk Earth. Like at least it's dominating to be the world for more than 150 million years. Tyrannosaur. And then they were murdered. All these majestic creatures vanished in a split second. And that was a pliosaur, not a mosasaur. Oh shoot! Did they get that part wrong? I didn't even notice that. But yeah, look at that tail here. Long-necked monsters up to. Ah. Uh... Got that wrong. Pliosaurs had been extinct since, like, the Middle Cretaceous. Uh, sharp eyes there, Ken. Okay. Uh, I didn't even think that they would get that wrong because he literally says marine lizards here. Which mosasaurs are, but pliosaurs are not. Uh. Pterosaurs filled the skies. Marine lizards and long-necked monsters up to 15 meters yeah. swam in the mosasaur. oceans. And on land, tis, tis. basically everything larger than one meter yeah. was a dinosaur. One of the most successful animals ever to walk Earth, dominating the world for more than 150 million years. And then there, probably. they were murdered. All these majestic creatures vanished in a split second of geological time. Why? Yes. Again, because it is so incredibly abrupt, 
the idea of a gradual volcanic eruption doesn't seem to fit with this at all. The the KPG extinction event was the most abrupt in the history of life on Earth. It's not a prolonged affair. It's not like a slow choking out of life on Earth. It's practically instantaneous from a geological perspective. The exact timeline that you would expect from, say, a large bolide striking the Earth, like an asteroid. You know? It is true that around that time, yeah. a big asteroid hit. And Evane says, new pictures and 3D prints every day. I admire that. What dedication. Thank you, Evane. That means a lot to me. I, I put a lot of effort into this, and it's... Um, yeah, I, I try and shake things up. And Moon Pie, do you appreciate that as well? Here, come here. We might be getting a... A cat visit here. Uh, and there you go, cat. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. Um, all of those times where diseases have caused the extinction of entire groups of animals. Oh, oh, Mumbai, how are you doing? Yeah. It's good to see you. Let's get the cat cam fired up. There we go. Yeah. Checking out the fern there? Yeah, plastic fern. Good stuff, Moon Pie. Good stuff. Yeah, I know you like that one. Yeah, Moon Pie loves plants, especially when they're plastic. She's quite fond of them. She's much more. She's much less likely to uh, destroy or damage a plastic plant. Too. Her and the last. <laughs> uh, oh, Moon Pie. Yeah. Yeah, we need to uh, brush her. Let's brush you, Moon Pie. Here we go, get some of that excess there. Much of it. Too much hair, Mumbai. Too much hair. Yeah. There we go. Um. Yeah. Jules Verne wrote a document. Yeah, there you go, Le Petit. I read that back in, uh, I think that was middle school. I was actually kind of bored by it. It's a long book for what it is. Journey to the Center of the Earth. Jules Verne had some really interesting ideas. I don't think he was great at crafting stories, however. He was more of an ideas man than, uh, than a storyteller, I think. For example, like, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. I tried to reread that a number of years ago. I had read like an abridged version when I was a kid and I loved it. They really kind of punched up the story, made it a little bit more exciting. The actual book itself, the original novel, translated to English, it's dull. I hate to say it, but it's dull. There's not much of a plot. It's just kind of like this happens and that happens. They go to the Sargasso Sea. They go to the Volcano Island. There's a giant squid. It, there's no, like, overarching... The story doesn't go anywhere, really. You know? Yeah, but he did have great knowledge of technology at the time. Exactly, and he had... I don't remember... I don't actually remember if it's in the original novel, but in the 1954 Disney film, there's this whole theme where... Um, Captain Nemo and his crew had basically, like, discovered nuclear power. Um, that's, like, a plot line in the movie. Or it's at least an aspect of the movie. I don't remember if it's in the original novel. But it's interesting, you know? Um, I want to say that there was... I want to say that in the novel, there's, like, allusions to the Nautilus actually being 
driven by salt water? Or like they derive fuel from the salt water somehow? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. And 20,000 leagues was... Yes, exactly. The ocean is not 20,000 leagues deep. A, a league is about... Is it roughly equivalent to a fathom? Like, just under two meters? Yeah. Um... And Andrew Memorex, I think maybe you're thinking of Prehistoric Planet, as what David Attenborough narrated. It was Kenneth Branagh who narrated um, the original Walking with Dinosaurs back in 1999. Yeah. And a league is 5.5 kilometers? Really, Claire Burr? Holy cow, that's so much longer than I thought. Huh, league, unit. Unit of length. Uh, it may have originally represented roughly the distance a person could walk in an hour. Huh. Interesting. So we've got different definitions of it in different countries at different times. Huh. Interesting. Uh, National and American. Interesting, Frank Big Time. Hmm. Anyway, before we get too distracted, let's get back to our video here. Earth. But was this actually what killed the dinosaurs? And I'm aware, or Diagonal, did it I'm arrive aware. just in time to get all the blame? Because according to some recent science, just before. Oh boy. This giant object the size of San Francisco screaming toward Earth at an unfathomable speed. Maybe it just happened to arrive just by coincidence at the same time that, that you know, an extinction event was already underway, you know? It just happened to impact at that exact moment the extinction event took place, but it did, certainly didn't cause it. Oh, boy. For the asteroid strike, get all the blame. Because, according to some recent science, just before the asteroid struck, an ancient nightmare, older than even the dinosaurs, decided to destroy the world. Let's look at how it might have done it. The beast slowly awakens. Oh the ancient continents almost resembled the world of today, but not quite. India was still a continent-sized tropical island, full of lush rainforests and exotic life, on its way to smash into Asia. Yep. But this paradise also hosted something else. The Deccan Traps, a volcanic region a thousand kilometers wide and about to come to life in a dramatic fashion. The apocalypse began quietly and silently. About 800,000 years before the impact, the Deccan Traps began to exhale about 10 million tons of CO2 and sulfur dioxide each year. Which, which warmed in the, the earth. Of things was not that much, so for a long time, no one noticed. Ken says, you're going to be asking questions about this video for the next five, answering questions about this for the next five years. Yeah, Ken, shoot. This is, oh boy. This is going to be like a Jurassic World level debacle for paleontological science communication on the internet, isn't it? The problem was, these emissions wouldn't stop. And I agree, for Castle Dreamer, yeah. In years, they started to dangerously pile up in the atmosphere. About 300,000 years before the asteroid, the Deccan Traps started to vomit lava. This was nothing like a normal eruption. It was a lava flood. Imagine a landscape with volcanoes stretching we beyond flood the basalt. horizon. They were constantly active, releasing a steady flow of massive amounts of poison and lava, interrupted by much more violent and deadly eruptions. The lush paradise of India was the first victim as gigantic clouds spread toxic fumes and poisoned the coastal regions. Clouds of ash darkened the sky as rivers of magma started massive wildfires, eradicating many local ecosystems and paving the continent with dead dinosaurs. Still at this point, it all looked like a local catastrophe, one of many that have hit our planet over its billions of years of history. 
Yep. Had it stopped here, there might still be dinosaurs today. But there the are other birds. Hadn't even yeah. begun yet. The beast turns furious. The Deccan traps would just not stop spewing lava. And so, after hundreds of thousands of years of never ending volcanic emissions, the catastrophe became global. First, the planet experienced a wave of heating, with oceans getting at least 2 degrees Celsius hotter in just 100,000 years. And that's not really a rate of change that's going to cause a mass extinction. Again, this is pretty gradual. With cumulative effects, if this continued for a really, really long, long time, then you could get, you know, the kind of, like, runaway acidification of the oceans. And, um, yeah, that seems to have been what happened in the Permian mass extinction, which I think there's an understanding now that it may have been, like, a double-pulsed extinction, and it took, like, maybe a couple million years to happen. I think that the Siberian traps, which were probably the culprit in the Permian mass extinction before the dinosaurs, that may have been like an order of magnitude larger than the uh, Siberian traps, or than the Deccan traps, excuse me. It may have been so much bigger and worse at the end of the Permian than at the end of the Cretaceous. I do not buy this as an explanation for... Uh, you know, the end Cretaceous extinction. Yeah. Which is bad, but just about the time frame that leaves ecosystems a chance to adapt. But then, nature would pull a cruel prank. Some of the gases of the Deccan traps heated the planet up, while others cooled it down. But the mix was uneven, so after the initial warming, a period of cooling followed, massively stressing. Yet yeah, we don't have evidence of snow like this. I... So it was still greenhouse earth in the late Cretaceous like this. We didn't have crazy fluctuating temperatures. I don't know of any evidence that actually bears this out. You know? Yeah. And Ken says, I think, some also think that it being one supercontinent may have been why the Permian was so bad. I mean, that would be, a, that would make a lot of sense as well. Yeah. Um. Like, in this, like, massive continental climate like that, you could really, really stress out uh, the continental interior. It's harder to do when you've got separate continents with not as much continental interior there, you know? Um, X-Tina, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. The ecosystems that barely managed to adapt to the hotter temperatures. At the same time, the sulfur in the atmosphere came back down as acid rain, while the CO2 was acidifying the oceans and killing the plankton which was, and still is today, the basis of the food web in the oceans. Yeah, but it's not gradual, though. That's the thing, is that this would have been a more gradual signature, and that's absolutely not what we see at the KPG boundary. Here, I'll show you another clip. What drew you to this boundary, Jan? Well, Sean, we're looking here at the very topmost rocks of the Cretaceous. These rocks are literally packed with foraminifera. Foraminifera so are, are like Cretaceous. fossil plankton, basically. And these rocks here are the tertiary. And the base of the tertiary consists of a dark gray clay layer. And there, the life has almost disappeared. And the KT boundary is just in between. I can point at it. It's right here, where you see a contrast between the purple and the dark. It's an extremely sharp boundary. And just across that thin little boundary, there's this huge change in what you see in, in the forams. And why, why is that so stunning to you? It's so stunning because there is no preceding evidence of anything happening there. So yep. it doesn't matter if I take a piece here, a piece there, or just underneath what we call the KT boundary. The foraminifera will remain the same, so they don't change overnight. And then, bang, they're gone. So what's that tell you? That tells me the base of the food chain of the oceans disappeared. And everything which is dependent on it is totally zapped right at the boundary. So the point is that it was extremely rapid. And the crazy thing is, it's not just a question of sampling or something. It's like the more we study this, the more rapid it seems to be. The more carefully we look 
at the rocks at the kpg boundary it used to be called the kt now it's called the kpg it's a long story um the more instantaneous it seems that's not consistent with volcanic eruptions you know being the main culprit in this yeah and if plankton disappears a massive extinction is all but guaranteed but now the grand finale was about to begin about 50,000 years before impact the true apocalypse came like a cosmic horror breaking out of its prison the deccan traps roared and screamed and began to spew out tens of trillions of tons of magma and even more and i think they've got the dates wrong here i think most of this was actually after the the actual kpg boundary like i think the the biggest pulse was I'm not entirely sure about this, but I think I've heard that the biggest pulse of, of Deccan volcanism was after the extinction event. Or yeah. deadly gases in an onslaught that lasted for several thousand years, rolling over ecosystems, devastating everything they reached. For a time as long as all of human civilization, this lava Armageddon brought massive wildfires. Earthquakes and tsunamis smashed and shook. It's literally not. <sighs> Their timeline is off. Yeah. Yeah. And there you go, Murphy. Yeah, so that would be literally after the extinction event. So the, the mass extinction event seems to have been, it was like 66.05 million years ago or something like that. Yeah. Shook the continent. So much heat was released from the roaring hot interior of our planet that it might have created hypercanes, cyclones tens of kilometers wide with winds reaching almost 1,000 kilometers an hour, three times more than the deadliest hurricane ever recorded by humanity. These storms were so massive and intense that they could reach tens of kilometers into the stratosphere and rip holes into the ozone layer with devastating consequences for all life, now without protection from the sun's radiation. And of course, where the hyperstorms occurred, devastation and death would follow. And as if all this wasn't enough, out of the guts of the earth came colossal amounts of venom. Giant clouds loaded with mercury and hydrochloric acid rolled over the planet, delivering the final blow to the remnants of a once magnificent and fertile world. As food chains crumbled and the whole world around them collapsed, some of the last dinosaurs to ever walk the Earth may have died vomiting toxic foam while being bathed in acid rain. A cruel end for the members of a noble family that had ruled the world for so long. Then it just ended. The frenetic eruptions slowed down and the... So the funny thing about this is that so many of these different effects that they're saying were the result of volcanism have also been claimed as the result of an asteroid impact. Things like tsunamis, earthquakes, acid rain, massive, uh, uh, like clouds of sulfur and, and soot and dust, you know, blocking out the sun. It's interesting because I have colleagues who have tried to look at this kind of interplay between the volcanism and the asteroid impact. And those claws on the wings truck are horns again invaluable. Thank you for the 22 months of support. I really appreciate that truck horn. Thank you. Thank you. Posting Welcome back. Posting walk, posting wavy. It's good to see you here. Yeah. There we go. So, old friend of mine, we dug up a triceratops together in 2011. Alessandro Chiarenza is lead author on this paper. But basically, the idea behind this is that when you look really, really closely at the rock record right at the KPG boundary, you see temperature fluctuations. This is like estimates of global average temperatures. Temperatures rise with these 
like instances of vulcanism, vulcanism like this, where you've got these big eruption pulses. And so Earth temperatures were actually higher because of this, uh, you know, all of this outgassing from these volcanoes. So that when you've got an asteroid impact that occurs right here at the boundary, that may have cushioned the effect of the asteroid impact. Basically, the nuclear winter, the impact winter that resulted from the, the impact of that asteroid was not as severe as it could have been because global temperatures were already higher at the time. They were, like, almost artificially raised by those volcanic eruptions, by those greenhouse gases emitted by those volcanoes. So the idea here is that you've almost got, like, two opposing forces, where you've got volcanism that's ra raising the temperatures... And then you've got that asteroid impact that's pushing them down, but because temperatures were already artificially higher, that asteroid was not as devastating as it could have otherwise been. Which is an interesting idea. Because we know that this is a really, really severe extinction event. This has not been published yet, so take this with a grain of salt. But this is just like a rough estimate. I don't know how rough it is. It might actually be more precise than I realize. Of the extinction rates of these different groups of, uh, of vertebrate animals. You know, freshwater fishes, 40% of them died. Only 20% of the crocodilians and champsosaurs. 22% of turtles. 22% of uh, the tailed amphibians, salamanders, newts, etc. 94% of birds died out. 92% of lizard and snake species, 90% of mammal species, and then 100% of the non-avian dinosaur species. So the fact that we are here today, as mammals, our ancestors managed to survive when 90% of the other mammal species died out, that may actually be because of those volcanic eruptions. Kind of artificially raising Earth's temperature, or raising it, I, don't, I can't say artificially, because these are all natural processes, but raising it higher than it would otherwise be, give us a little bit of cushion for when that asteroid hit. You know? So, yeah. 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 Our Murph says, some Charistodira made it through. No, I think all of them, Murph. I don't know if any of the Champsosaur species went extinct at the boundary. Um, again, only 20% of the Crocodilians and Champsosaurs died out. I don't know why they're lumped together in this. They're not related closely. I don't think Champsosaurs are even Archosaurs. Um, but yeah, the Champsosaurs do really well across the boundary. They don't really get hit very hard. Um, especially when you compare it to, like, shoot... 92% of lizard and snake species. 92% of squamates bite the dust. 90% of mammals. 94% of bird species. Wild. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. <sighs> Let's continue with this. Endless natural disasters yeah. began to fade away. But the world was changed forever. The monster had left unfathomable devastation and corpses in its wake. Even the planet's ecosystems far away were severely wounded. It was the end of a whole geological era, a murder that started slowly and then turned loud and violent. And then it happened. Like a cosmic joke, on the other side of the world, a bright dot of light appeared in the sky. And an instant later, an asteroid 10 kilometers across smashed into Earth with the power of 4 billion atomic bombs. If you want to see what this was like, we made a whole video about it. If life on Earth was like a murder victim barely holding on, this was the final blow. Just too much. After the massacre on the other side of the world, the Deccan traps went on expelling tens of trillions of tons of deadly gases yep. for another 800,000 years. I want to see the majority sure the of it was after the extinction. Stayed covered in poison. When they eventually finished and truly went back to sleep, 75% of all species on Earth had perished. Most famously, almost all dinosaurs. Except birds. And only the a few only species dinos of birds. that are still with us today. Uh, like, the birds also almost went completely extinct. I want to emphasize that. 
like 94% of bird species at the time had died out. Which is a lot. That's a lot. Their stunning beauty and diversity are a shy reminder of how majestic and wonderful their larger cousins must have been. So, hmm. who was the murderer? Were the dinosaurs doomed by the traps, or would they have survived without the asteroid? Was it teamwork? Well, we don't know. Scientists have been fiercely debating this question for years, but for now we have no definite answer. The timeline of events that we've shown here is based on some of the most recent reconstructions of the evolution of the Deccan traps. There are other ones that paint a different picture, but right yep. now, scientists are still fiercely arguing over this. Check our sources to learn more. I think if you were to do a survey of geologists who study this period in Earth history and paleontologists who study this period in Earth history, you would probably find that it's something like an 80-20 split. 80% accept the asteroid hypothesis. They think that it best explains the available information. And then maybe like 20% think that volcanism may have actually played a larger role. If you had to split those into a binary like that, I'm sure there are a lot of researchers who would kind of prefer to sort of split the difference there. But yeah, yeah. And thank you, Willow Mation. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Uh, X-Man says you can find 20% of people who believe almost anything. I mean, not in, a, not in the scientific world. Like, we, there are general consensus. There is general consensus that we have as scientists about most things in nature. You know? If you already take that same group of people, the 80-20 like I talked about, and say... What do you think explains the diversity of life on Earth? It would be pretty darn near to 100% who would say, well, shoot, natural selection. You know, natural evolutionary processes. So, yeah. Likewise, if you're talking about, you know, what makes an apple fall? Gravity is what people are going to say. That's what researchers are going to say because that's the best explanation that we have that matches all of the information that we have, you know? So yeah, yeah. Um, and Sim Simonel says, who is the biggest promoter of paleontology in the English language? Oh, I don't know. That's That's a tough one. Do you mean as a scientist or as a media person or in Portuguese we have a guy named Pirula. Have you heard of him? I have not. Sim Sim no. I have not heard of Pirula. Huh. Um interesting. But yeah, yeah. And this feels like the bird origin debate of 20 years ago. I know, right, Diagonal? Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. Um, that's the thing, is that, like... There's this idea about scientific consensus that we have. There, there's, a, there's an old phrase that that science progresses one funeral at a time. And it's a grim thing to say. But... I guess the underlying idea is that if you have scientists from one particular school of thought Say, for instance, uh, geologists who thought the continents did not move. And then you've got this new idea that crops up. Continental drift, tectonic plates, the continents do move. And that explains so much about the world around us. It fits the data really well. You've got more data that accumulate. And then you've got kind of a growing consensus there. The idea that science progresses one funeral at a time is that, like, well, a lot of those old guard scientists, the old boys club, they're not really going to accept this 
so you kind of just have to wait for them to die off, or rather to be replaced by younger people who don't have these kind of preconceived notions, and they're willing to follow the evidence wherever it leads. But I don't know, I can think of a lot of counterexamples to this. In dinosaur paleontology, for instance, the idea that birds evolved from dinosaurs, you know, this is an idea that's been floating around for a long time. And in the 1990s, when we started to actually discover feathered dinosaurs, most dinosaur paleontologists were completely convinced by this. They didn't have to die off for the, the general consensus to change. They changed their minds instead with the presentation of new evidence. It became ridiculous to think that birds evolved from some other group of animals when we literally have dinosaurs with, like, proper flight feathers. You know? Asymmetrical flight feathers on non-bird dinosaurs. So yeah. Yeah. Gut says, my heart shattered into pieces after finding out how velociraptors actually looked. Really, Gut? Like 10 years ago? I think they look so much cooler now, and they're so much scarier. Shoot. Um, it's an animation of a uh, big feathered dromaeosaur like Utah Raptor. Yeah. I think they're so much more interesting now. Yeah. I know I found them cool, but Child Me didn't accept the fact that they're feathered. Huh, okay. Yeah. That reminds me of another here. Uh... Reminds me of, uh... Of this right here. This lovely webcomic. Um. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I kind of get the same feeling with, like, the volcanism hypothesis versus the asteroid impact hypothesis. And that volcanism or some sort of, like, gradual extinction event like this is what wiped out the dinosaurs, except for a few birds. That was kind of the default hypothesis. And as, you know, geologists, I think, are kind of trained to think in gradual terms because most processes in geology are gradual. They take a long time. They're not sudden and catastrophic, you know? The whole field of geology had to kind of emerge out of this, this catastrophic viewpoint before that like oh yeah all of the rocks on earth were were laid down in the great noachian flood described in the book of genesis in the bible that was kind of how geology was born at the beginning and it took a long time for for you know the the first real geologist to, to realize like hey shoot that doesn't make any sense the Earth is actually a lot older than we realized, and most of these processes are very gradual, you know? In the 1980s, I think a lot of geologists were still kind of wedded to this idea of gradualism because the idea of catastrophism was anathema to them. It was like, that seemed like a biblical thing. It seemed anti-scientific. So this idea that there could be an asteroid impact that would just change things over the course of, you know weeks to months to maybe a year or so maybe if maybe a couple years that's instantaneous in geological thinking you know that idea was crazy but the evidence shows that the that extinction event is practically overnight you know so yeah yeah um but yeah, yeah. Fiery faces, it's fascinating learning about how the Earth has changed. Absolutely, yeah. Um, 
Anyway. And hey, Rachidactylus, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Alright, let me see if I can find a... What video was that? I saw it. Um... How science advances one funeral at a time. Ah. This is... The channel is called New Economic Thinking? That sounds like some sort of nonsense here. Very skeptical of anything with economic in the title. But... Let's see if this is any good. There is some evidence on the fact that before, I'm talking about 30, 40 years ago. Graduate School of Economics. Economics is not a science. Being in, a, in an Ivy League or in a top university was a very strong predict predictor of future success. I think in this uh, era now, there's also some evidence on this that... You know him, Ricky Douglas? It's relatively less crucial to be in one of these places. Once you say that there, it's not that crucial to be in a top university, then all of a sudden, many more scientists are possible contributors to a field. My name is Christian Fons Rosen. Mm. I'm an associate professor at University of Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona and also a member of the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics. My research topics are mainly on innovation on the one hand and on the other hand, political economy. Max Planck, a Nobel Prize the same meta science ago, Oh, cool, Rika The idea that uh, for new ideas to be in, in the forefront, to be, to be the new paradigms, this was a... And the paper this is going to be about too, is this, is this any good in your estimation, Rika I, my heckles are always raised anytime somebody is, you know, talking about economics, but yeah, uh, I have one issue with it, but it's decent. Okay. Huh. To happen, mainly because established people are people of older age. It's harder for them to change the mindset and to be convinced about new ideas. We have the title of the paper, the science. And the, these subtitles are all wonky. What's going on here? Subtitles. Options. No. Nope. Korean auto-generated. No, nope, we want English. That's bizarre. Okay, whatever. Advance one funeral at a time. This is borrowed from Max Planck, where he said that you really have to wait for the current generation to die in order for the next generated generation to come up with the, with the new ideas. This is also very interesting, I think, from a political economy perspective, if you look at Brexit, for example, who voted remain and who voted leave. Yeah, it's, it's very age divided. Age. So I think this general point yeah. about age is, could not only be true about innovation, but about the general ability to, to accept new ideas. Let me... And But that's that's kind of assuming that, that scientists are unwilling or unable to accept new ideas, which maybe that's true in larger fields or fields that have got more kind of institutional clout or more kind of like economic incentive driving them. Paleontology doesn't seem like it's like that for the most part. There are very, very, very few paleontologists nowadays who do not accept the idea that birds evolved from dinosaurs. Almost everybody changed their mind about that. There are a few people who didn't, and some of them have died. But there's maybe like two people I can think of off the top of my head who don't accept the idea that birds evolved from dinosaurs. Two paleontologists, I mean. Um, but yeah, people like Larry Martin died back in like 2013. Um, so yeah, Alan Fiducia is one of them, Sloppy Salamander. In fact, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, Darren Nash wrote about this on his blog. This is a book that just came out not too long ago by Alan Fiducia, and he is part of this... I don't know if you could even call it a cadre of scientists nowadays. It's like two or three guys who uh, do not accept that birds evolved from dinosaurs. They think that birds evolved from some sort of unknown, like... Thecodontian crocodile relative back in the Triassic period whose fossils have never been found. Um, 
To abandon. Yeah, well, that's that's the name of this. They've been termed the Birds Are Not Dinosaurs, or BAND, B-A-N-D, uh, people. Hang on. I think... I have that in a book here somewhere. There. Um, Mark Norell's book about feathered dinosaurs from China. Let's see if I can find that for you. He talks about that in here. Bright red book. Or at least it was before I took the dust jacket off. Where did that go? Um, it's called something like uh, Unearthing the Dragon or something like that. of taking the really brightly colored books and tucking them behind these parts so I can't see them. There we go. Unearthing the Dragon by Mark Norell. And in this he talks about band. And if we're lucky, it'll be in the index. So I don't have to go hunting around for it. Oh, a short index. That's never good. Um, oh, there it is. 218 to 219. Yes. Page 218 to 219. There we go. Yeah. It's, I guess, just text here, but it's a nice shame. So the discovery of feathered dinosaurs should have put to rest, should have laid to rest any lingering doubts about the link between non-avian dinosaurs and avians. In fact, many in the academic community, especially ornithologists, scientists who study living birds and are largely unfamiliar with the paleontological literature, changed their minds, as all scientists must occasionally do, and recanted their previous support for alternative theories. Nevertheless, right after the first G-hole specimens, it's from this particular formation in China, were collected a few paleontologists who with a Taliban-like zeal believe it not possible for birds to find their ancestry in theropod dinosaurs were quick to reject the new evidence. Some of this group formed a loose association that had been given the acronym BAND for Birds Are Not Dinosaurs, B-A-N-D. BAND adherents had developed a cottage industry of naysaying and incredulity. Not large in number, band members are noteworthy for their obstreperous, evolving rhetoric and their failure to observe modern scientific methods. Uh, some of my most depressing days are ones where I've had to deal with the feeding frenzy of misinformation and bad science, chummed up by band around almost every discovery that is made concerning bird origins and feathered dinosaurs. It's not as if these guys are stupid, or that on occasion band members have not made contributions, yet most of their comments have nothing to do with the science. I feel as if many of the papers written by band members should carry the prelude to one of those television shows that I grew up with. This is a fifth dimension, beyond which... <laughs> uh, beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast in space uh, and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition. Anyways, from the Twilight Zone. It's a long quote. The most outspoken members of the band include Larry Martin, a paleontologist at the University of Kansas. And, uh... Yeah, he died back in 2013. Um, right before... Uh, it was not too long before the, the meeting at SVP, I feel. Um, and Alan Fiducia, an ornithologist from North Carolina State University. And John Rubin, a zoologist at Oregon State. Um, yeah. Oh, and also Storrs Olson, a Smithsonian Institution ornithologist. He may have actually changed his mind, though. Welcome to another edition of Lifestyles of the Large and Extinct. And Wolf of Science, it is great to have you here. Welcome to Paleontologize. Thanks for joining us. Uh, um, and Cast the Dreamer, I agree with you there. Yeah. Anyway, one of these guys who's still around, Alan Fiducia, actually published a book recently. And Darren Nash has got a lengthy review of it, which is... Yeah... The book can best be summarized as an effort to show the view of dinosaurs promoted by scientists, specialists as chaotic, shallow, and unthinking, 
and driven by a quest for popularity and an adherence to cult cladism. Anyway, it's a it's an interesting review. I've not read the book myself, but suffice it to say that that book is not in the scientific mainstream. These guys are on the fringe, the band members, the people who claim that birds are not dinosaurs, very much on the fringe of the science. So yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, and Netherfire, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Uh, Mr. Mushroom says, uh, what, what did you study? So, a lot of dinosaur-related stuff. A lot of, like, kind of basic functional morphology of theropod dinosaurs and that kind of thing, but branching out a bit, yeah. Yeah, anyway. Um, so, does science progress one funeral at a time? Ooh talk about Darwinian evolution. Well, Charles Darwin, on the origin of species, 1859, this revolutionary theory, well, uh, perhaps the world is not that, that as young as we thought, planet Earth. Actually, it was not that easy for these new ideas to be, to be mainstream. It is true that mainly among scientists, there was a, a greater likelihood of accepting these ideas, but it was- And that's kind of the crazy thing, is that most scientists, most publishing scientists at the time, were convinced they did change their minds with this new evidence. I would say that the, if you want to call it the Darwinian revolution, it was pretty swift. It happened pretty quickly. And it didn't require, like, an older generation of scientists to die out. It just didn't. Yeah. Mayor Space says, each one of us runs the risk of stagnating and thinking, that's it, my intellectual journey ends here. This new bridge you built is too scary for me to cross. Yeah, but I mean, that's a big part of science is, is you know, forging ahead like that. Not being scared of new ideas. So yeah, yeah. And Diagonal says, this would be a good time to open packages. Let me, give me just a minute, Diagonal. But yeah, not, I'll get into that. It was Thank not you. done in a day. It took uh, quite a bit of time. And what we do in the paper is we don't look at these radical events like evolutionary theory. We look at normal science. We look at normal science in the life sciences in the U.S. So hmm. think of biomed, you know. And uh, we ask, what happens to a, to a scientific subfield? What happens to a field when a superstar in that field just passes away unexpectedly while this person is still huh. actively doing research. The bigger question we want to ask is the progress in science, is the direction of it unavoidable and fully based on like fundamentals of science or other aspects like individual motivations or incentives, do they play a role to decide where science goes next? What we do find in a nutshell is that actually these fields increase in the activity after the death of the superstar. So it's not that these fields by any means suffer. What is true is that the ones that suffer is the close circle of the superstar. So people that collaborated with hmm. the superstar, these people feel a reduction in their, in their publication cap capabilities. But there is a lot of new f blood coming in from outside, people that never worked with the superstar, even people that never worked in that subfield. All of a hmm. sudden they see that the gate opened and they enter, and they enter with new ideas. What we find interesting is that it's not huh. that they radically change the type of questions they want to answer. They're still very much in the, in the mainstream of the field, but they, they try to address the same problems with a different angle. Perhaps we, one could even link it to this era of, of big data. There is more and more data available, so it's not anymore the case that only the more established researchers have access to those amazing data sets or amazing insights. And I think this is bringing a lot of vitality to the field. Lobbying has mm. been... Um... Anyway, I should... Uh... Rickadactylus, if you have this paper and could send it to me. Let's see if I can find it real quick and see if it's open access. The science advance one funeral at a time. There we go. This was published August 2019. Download full text. And we got it. Yeah, very nice. Here's a link right there for anybody interested. If this uh, fascinates you as much as it does me, 
I will be reading this maybe tomorrow morning. Good stuff. Uh, and Lawrence is a big part of it's probably schools not generally having a good grasp of when to switch from teaching like uh, these are facts about the world which is certainly appropriate at times especially with a younger audience to this is how we're pretty sure things are right now shoot I think a lot of people yeah I think you're a hundred percent right about that Lauren yes yes and that's I think this is particularly an issue in the United States. Um, but it probably is in a lot of other countries as well. It's also like a personality type thing, too. Where there are a lot of people who are just really uncomfortable with the idea of any kind of ambiguity or uncertainty or nuance. Because certainty feels comfortable to a lot of people. It feels safe and they know what to expect you know even though that's not really the way that the world works oftentimes and as educators in science we should be striving to to demonstrate to people that sometimes that uncertainty and nuance is really Cool and interesting. I'm Not something to be scared of. Work of vertebrate paleontologists. And tiniest lights. Rin, thank you, thank you for the follow. Welcome to paleontology. Uh, to me, part of what makes paleontology so interesting and part of what makes dinosaur science so appealing to me is that there is so much that we still don't know. We are surrounded by mysteries on all sides. But those mysteries are conquerable. They are solvable. We can figure this stuff out. We can continue to to push against the perimeter of our of our knowledge, push it further and further out. I don't remember who said this, um, but I, it's a neat little turn of phrase. That as our as the diameter of our knowledge grows the circumference of our ignorance also expands. The more we expand this, this bubble of our knowledge, the more surface area there is of, of ignorance around the outside. Because the more we learn, the more we realize we don't know. And that's cool. That's interesting. That, that gives us a reason to get up in the morning and get into the laboratory or get into the field or or get out and do outreach with the general public, you know? So yeah, yeah. Yeah. Rinkodactylus says, yeah, it's a decent paper. Like I said, they ignored how, mo how most superstars are men, and possibly they're showing as the elite of a field get more diverse, there's more opportunities for new scholars. Yeah, and I think... I also wonder if they talk about the rise of the internet and um, digital communication. Because I would think that would also play a huge role in this as well. Never before has so much knowledge been available, so much information just been available at the click of a mouse. You know, we've got the sum total of human knowledge practically at our very fingertips on the internet. And that can allow people who don't have your traditional kind of institutional power behind them. People who are, you know, maybe in a more of an independent situation. People like me can still make contributions to a field, even if I'm not in a tenure-track faculty job. Even if I don't have a laboratory of my own, I can still make contributions to a scientific field. And in some ways, that gives me more flexibility and more time for doing this than I would otherwise have of if I spent, you know, maybe 60% of my waking hours writing grant proposals or something, you know? But yeah, yeah. 
Um, but yeah, yeah. And MJ builds. Holy cow! Thank you for the five gift subs there. Well, there's a asteroid that didn't uh, cause much damage. <laughs> MJ thank you, MJ Builds. Things with those five gift subs. With those five gift subs. Thank you, thank you. Really appreciate it. There are five people in the chat right now who I'm sure are cheering because they won't have to watch any ads for the next 30 days. Thanks to you, MJ Builds. Appreciate you. I really do. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. And Casey Snowart, you're absolutely right. This whole idea of, like, teaching to the test, no child left behind, uh, you know, just, like, add rigid adherence to a curriculum. Usually those curricula are not particularly good. Especially when it comes to, like, biological science in the U.S. You can go through, you know, from pre-K all the way up through high school, and take a bunch of biology classes along the way and never learn, like, the core fundamental principle in biology, which is that life changes over time. It's horrifying how many students go through that system and they never learn about evolution. They have no concept of common ancestry. It's, what was it, uh, I think Theodore Dobzhansky? who said that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And that's, he's 100% correct about that, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. But MJ Builds says, if you need whatever, let me know. I'm around here sometimes. MJ Builds, did I miss something? Can I build an outreach program for you? Also, so many women in history are unsung heroes. Absolutely, MJ Builds, yeah. Shoot, we're going to be talking about Mary Anning. Uh, the founding mother of paleontology. We'll be celebrating her birthday in May. And do I have a recording of that from last year? No, shoot. Um, yeah, well, that's often our biggest stream of the year. Um, so I hope you'll be around for that, MJ Bills. Yeah, May 21st is her birthday. Mary Anning. Discoverer of many different fossil species. From the, I think, Middle Jurassic of the Dorset Coast? Lyme Regis? Yeah. Yep. Southwest England. Um, and I will not be in Wyoming then, Lenina. No. No, I'm not going to leave for Wyoming until the 25th at the earliest, I think. Yeah. 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 Uh, Trisha Sapp says, you also have to realize a lot of women took male aliases to be taken more seriously in their field. Yeah. People like... Um, what was Mary Shelley's pen name? She wrote Frankenstein. Um, George Eliot, another famous example of a, a writer who took on a male alias in order to be, you know, to have some hope of being able to actually be recognized for her talent. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, yeah. Get the recording from the Bristol Museum talk on Mary Anning for that day. I'm not sure I know what recording you're talking about, or what talk you're talking about, Salman. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Um, the history of vertebrate paleontology does not have enough women in it yet. I like to think that that is changing. If we look at... I don't know. If we have some indication of, of what the kind of the gender ratio is in, in paleontology nowadays, invertebrate paleontology, it might come from this. This is uh, 
bunch of vertebrate paleontologists dancing at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting. Um, there's Danny Barter right there. Uh, um, I went to Montana State with him. I've heard some estimates that the majority of... Oh, there's my undergrad advisor right there. Uh, there's Dave Vericchio right there. Yeah. I've heard some estimates that the, the majority of graduate students in vertebrate paleontology nowadays are female. That it's like a 55-45 split. Um, I don't know if that's correct. But... Vertebrate paleontology is also overwhelmingly white. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. We could talk about that another time. That's not necessarily like something to be too, too, too worried about, just in the sense that it's like if you come from a an underprivileged minority group, the way to, to become middle class is not to become a paleontologist. It's to become a medical doctor or a lawyer or some other profession like that that actually pays, you know? Paleontology all too often is just a... <laughs> it can be a, a vow of poverty, in a sense. So if we solve that problem, then I'd be much more enthusiastic about, like, trying to bring people of other backgrounds and I, I just have weird mixed feelings about it when it's like, yeah, as a paleontologist, you're... You might be living in poverty for the rest of your life. I don't... I don't wish that on anybody unless they're really, really passionate about the subject matter, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Like being an artist or a musician always broke. It kind of orchestra, yeah. Yeah. And there you go, Lord, yeah. <laughs> uh... And Dan the BC man says, looks like a dance club, not a scientist meeting. I mean, that's why I showed you this, you know? Is that this is at the end of the conference. This is kind of like the after party. Um, yeah. <laughs> There's Nate Carroll right there. Um, old friend of mine. Nate's a, Nate's a really good guy. Jing May O'Connor, she showed up on yesterday's stream in a video about feathered dinosaurs. Yeah. So anyway. I show this to try and humanize paleontologists for the rest of you, you know? Yeah. We're not all, uh... Certainly there are many more dinosaurs waiting to be discovered. Many new mysteries waiting to be pondered. Dennis Carpes, thank you for the follow and welcome to paleontology. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Diagonal says symposium originally meant drinking party in Greek. Really, Diagonal? I did not know that. Huh. Um, but yeah. Speaking of, of you, Diagonal, a package showed up in the mail today. I got to visit the P.O. Box this morning. And take a look at this. Here, let me... There we go. Make sure I got all the zip codes on there. But diagonal, I'm not sure what this is, but it feels like it feels like books. And I am uh oh man. You know I'm into books. If you sent me something diagonal, it's got to be good. Holy cow. Let's, uh, let's take a look here. Yeah. Get this opened up. Mm. 
Well, well, well. Let's see here. Ooh, ooh, I feel I feel several books in here, I think. <laughs> Diagonal, thank you, thank you. Holy cow. This is a classic, classic, classic book in the history of uh, of science education here in the United States. Um, this is a creationist textbook called Of Pandas and People. And this is at the center of a big court case in, uh, in 2005. Uh, here's a trailer for a documentary about it right here. Uh, the beginning. Here we go. On Nova. I believe there is an intelligent design. In the beginning, God created. Saying that you don't believe in evolution is almost saying we don't believe that the Civil War ever took place in the United States. Uh, an extraordinary court case ignites a small town. It's like a civil war within the community. There's no question. And diagonal. But science itself <laughs> on trial. I appreciate you sending it. Very important things were at stake. One is the future of science education in this country. Nova reveals the story behind the headlines. Anywhere you turned, we were getting attacked. Witnesses um, started dropping like flies. And probes the question. Is intelligent design a scientific alternative to evolution? It's Probably not. Spoiler alert. It's science not. Science class. Or religion in disguise. It's Spoiler, it is. Of yeah. everything we mean and everything we understand by science. Judgment Day. Intelligent design on trial. On yeah. Nova. And so part of what sparked this whole court case in the first place was the introduction of these textbooks, which are religious textbooks, into an American public school in Dover, Pennsylvania. Um, oh yeah, yeah, and there's a, there's a piece of history here, Diagonal, I, uh, really appreciate you sending it. Um, it's, uh, what do they have to say about the fossil record, for instance? Scientists now read the fossil record as a chronicle of life in former ages. Yeah, there we go. Gaps in the fossil record is a major heading right there. Uh, Darwin, the greatest objection against my theory. Uh, yeah, anyway, the whole point of this is like, oh, you know... The fossil record doesn't actually show evolution, which it absolutely does. Fact versus interpretation, you know, just hogwash. Anyway, this is an important piece of history here, and I appreciate you sending it, Diagonal, I really do. Yeah. Um, and let's see what else is in here. Because that's not the only book in here. We've also got... <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Uh, when is this from? This Scientific American issue. Holy cow! This is brilliant. March two thousand three. I do not have this one, nor have I ever had this one. But this is from. Uh, we were talking about the uh, the discovery of feathered dinosaurs and how that basically demonstrated that birds evolved from dinosaurs. Yeah, bye-bye birdie dinosaurs had them first. New evidence hints that they were even used for flight. Cool stuff. Yeah. Really neat. This is lovely. I could frame this. Yeah. There's a, a framed... This framed illustration is in the front lobby at the Museum of Paleontology in Berkeley. Yeah. Very cool, yeah. A long cherished view of how and why feathers evolved has now been overturned. Good stuff. Yeah. 
really neat. These are some beautiful illustrations, and I've seen these in other places, too. Um, like this one showing the, the interlocking kind of architecture of feather barbs. Really neat. Yeah. Yeah, how feathers grow. Really neat developmental biology here. Yeah, Evo Devo and the feather. Neat stuff. And I love that this was the cover story. There's Microraptor right there. Dinosaur or bird, the gap narrows. Yeah. Um, very cool. Thank you, thank you, Diagonal. This is lovely. And look at this. Why birds are dinosaurs right there in oh this is lovely from february 1998 yeah and this must have been just after the discovery of like codipteryx um and only a couple years after sinoceropteryx this is uh this is lovely here let's find that here we go yes oh man this is one of the figures that i actually referenced when i was putting together the uh the turkey diagram Got that semi-lunate carpal bone right there. That, like, half-moon-shaped wrist bone. In... Who is this? This is gonna be... I'm not sure. Maybe Coelophysis, Allosaurus, Velociraptor, Archaeopteryx, and probably a pigeon. Um... Whoa, bingo! Yeah, there we go. Coelophysis... Allosaurus. Allosaurus, who is behind me right here. Velociraptor, Archaeopteryx, Columba, which is a pigeon. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, this is exactly what we were talking about. This is fantastic, Diagonal. Wonderful timing. Um, thank you so much for sending this. This is so cool. Like, this is... This is a bit of of dinosaur science history here. This is lovely. Very cool. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. Both a bird and a dinosaur. Very cool. Really neat. Thank you, thank you, Diagonal. And then. All new dinosaurs and their friends from the great recent discoveries. Sam Wells, holy cow. This is going to be a bit older. I'm guessing this is from the 70s. Let's take a look. Um, yeah. What's the publication date for this? 1984. Okay. Yeah. Anistrophius, there's an ancestral ichthyosaur, Dupesuchus, Desmatosuchus, and then, yeah, we get into our Riohosaurus here. Sauropods, Dilophosaurus, oh, this is lovely. I've never seen this Dilophosaurus illustration before. This is really cool. This is really cool, diagonal. Holy moly. I can't wait to to go through this cover to cover. And that's so funny. We've got a Decreosaurus with a trunk right there. <laughs> ah, that's funny. Yeah. Lovely. Oh, this is great. And look at that old Spinosaurus illustration there. Oh, man. Yeah. It's a pretty doofy looking Deinonychus, but I don't know. I like it. Uh, um, and an over after. Just look at the. It's got the such creepy looking forelimbs. They're like not bending in the right places. <laughs> uh, yeah. And Sauronithoides. See, this is wild because. This is at a time when Sauronithoides was probably as well known as Velociraptor to the general public. Today, nobody knows about Sauronithoides. But there it is right there. 
you know, nowadays it would be Velociraptor and Oviraptor. But before Jurassic Park, almost nobody in the general public had ever heard of Velociraptor. These two animals were published in the same paper. Um, Henry Fairfield Osborne, 1924. So it was Oviraptor, Sauronithoides, and Velociraptor, all published in the same paper. And here, Velociraptor wasn't even popular enough to include. Yeah. Um, interesting stuff. Yeah. Anoplosaurus, Phobosugus. This is cool. This is very cool. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Diagonal. This is very thoughtful. And last but not least... Ah! Diagonal, didn't you send me a, um... A PDF of this one time? This book is hilarious. Science Made Stupid, How to Discomprehend the World Around Us. It is very funny. Uh, um, the water cycle. Condescension, participation, elaboration. <laughs> uh, and of course you have the jet stream and the propeller stream. Uh, different kinds of clouds. Status clouds. Serial comic clouds. Circular sta status, cartoon clouds, strato cruiser, nimble clouds, uh, um, continental drift. Around 200 million years ago, years ago, the continents are jammed together in a single great landmass called Pangaea. By the end of this striptic era, continental drift had split Pangaea into two supercontinents on either side of the 20th parallel, Laurasia to the north and Gondwana to the south. The Laurasia Gondwana thing is correct. Uh, with 65 million years left on the clock, Madagascar sweeps right and fakes to Africa. South America blocks North America's rush. Australia goes wide as Antarctica runs a post-pattern downfield. Eurasia reads the play but is hooked in by a block from the Indian subcontinent. <laughs> uh, the current phase of the continental drift begins. Situation calls for an onside kick. <laughs> Uh, this is great. Um, thank you, Diagonal. This made my day. Um, thank you, thank you. This is lovely. Very thoughtful of you. And I'm sure it wasn't cheap to, to get this shipped here, too. So thank you very much for that. Really appreciate that. Holy cow. Um, all of these lovely publications here. And, um, well, a lovely but very stupid one here, and an even stupider one here. <laughs> very, very thoughtful, Diagonal. I really appreciate this. Holy cow. Lovely. Yeah. Um, good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Claire, Bur Claire Bur knew exactly what I was going to say there. Yeah, Diagonal. I appreciate you. I really, really do. Um, is Diagonal? Diagonal is here. Good, 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 good. Yeah. You've already got that VIP badge, Diagonal. Or you know you'd be getting one right now. I appreciate you very much. Thank you kindly, Diagonal. It was very thoughtful of you, and I appreciate it tremendously. This is Laura Dern of Jurassic Park. Digging up dinosaurs is hard, frustrating work. It takes months or years, so leave it to the professionals. Lasagna Hog, thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Uh, yeah, yeah. And Dunpeel Hunter, I saw a headline about that. I've not had a chance to read it yet, but we'll probably talk about that Thursday, I'm guessing. Tomorrow we're talking about manatees and other Cyrenians, and other Afrothiers. But uh, yeah, it's a manatee stream tomorrow. Does anybody here like manatees? I do. We've also got a little uh, little letter here, all the way from distant and exotic Canada. Um, lovely. See, Canada right there. The return label. 
Um, let's take a look. Yeah. Very nice handwriting. I'm jealous, says Lenina. Okay, let me read this first off camera just to make sure. I'm not doxing anybody or anything. I'm not sure who this is from. Oh, this is lovely. Oh, this is so cool. Itsy Bitsy Bones. This is amazing. Bitsy Bones. I uh, just want to say thank you so much for what you do and the wonderful community you've built. I really appreciate that, Itsy Bitsy Bones. It's very inspiring, and I look forward to one day getting into the field to study fossil marine reptiles more. I really hope you get a chance to do that, Itsy Bitsy Bones. That would be incredible for you, and we need more people studying marine reptiles. There's so much we still don't understand about, about Mesozoic marine reptiles and marine reptiles in general. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And P.S. The sticker is glow in the dark. Well, well, well. What's this? A chicken. The legendary art attack. Thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Yeah, we've got a special glow in the dark sticker here of Stan Skull. I know this particular T-Rex. Stan. That's really neat, Bones. That's really neat. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, the teeth are hanging out. That's just... That's what Stan looks like, Clario. Yeah. But, uh... This is lovely. Shoot. I will put this in my collection of special stickers that will adorn my new laptop when the time finally comes for me to get a new... a new miniature laptop. Um... I thought that was going to be, like, this week. But luckily, Ios was able to uh, to do some fiddling around with... She showed me how to clear some things out of my laptop, and uh, it is significantly faster than it used to be, so I might be able to use it for another couple years. And I will continue to accumulate these stickers, and the moment I need a new laptop, they're going right on there. Mini Pie, how are you doing? Hello, hello. We might be getting uh, another... Oh. Might, not might, we just did. Got a visit from another cat. I believe this, this constitutes a cat trick. That is all three cats in one stream. Mini pie, yeah. <laughs> We've had all three cats today, this is lovely. Um, fantastic. Mini pie, how is your afternoon going? You having a good day? I like how, how all three of you cats show up on stream and you all show off your different personalities. Minnie Pie is like feisty and curious and she's a troublemaker. Aren't you, Minnie Pie? Aren't you? Yeah. She's, uh, she's froggy, this cat here. Yeah. She's, she's got moxie. Huh. Yeah. Want some attention? Or do you want a you want a treat? Is that what you want? Here, let's let's watch her demeanor change as I grab a treat here. Ooh. Yeah, you know that's it. go, Mini Pie. There you go. Yeah, good stuff. You better chew that. Let's swallow it whole. And you swallowed it whole. Okay, not great. But yeah, Mini Pie. Yeah, thanks for saying hello. You look like you, you could use some brushing, too. Yeah, you do. You're shedding everywhere. Yeah. Oh, 
<laughs> yeah, look at you lick those chops. <laughs> uh, she definitely enjoyed that. Uh, you know, Mini Pie, I think you enjoy being on camera, don't you? She goes. All right. We'll see you later, Mini Pie. Thanks for visiting. Yeah. Uh, um. Dunpeel Hunter says, "How does it type? Just fine." Yeah. I've been using this keyboard for. Well, actually, this is my second one. I had another one that I had for about six years. Yeah. And there's a matching wooden mouse. Yeah. Anyway, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, I will have to wrap up the stream in the next hour. Realistically, like, probably the next 40 minutes. But for right now, let's return to our documentary that we were watching earlier. Yeah. Excavating dinosaurs in wild and exotic places like Ontario. Uh, they're not actually excavating dinosaurs in Ontario. They have an establishing shot of Toronto here because they're uh, that's where the institution is located. The Royal Ontario Museum is, surprise, surprise, located in Ontario, in Toronto. But uh, they were out in Alberta digging up dinosaurs earlier. It will be months before David can unpack his prizes at the lab in the Royal Ontario Museum. Uh... And Mommy Does says, Today was the kids' share day at school. He brought his replica fossil collection and his PNSO Styracosaurus. Nice. Taught his class all about dinosaurs. That is super cool, Mommy Does. That is super, super cool. Holy cow. Um, good for him. I hope you had a good time. I... Any time that you can you can kind of foster a child's interest in dinosaurs, you are you're doing a good thing, you know. Boost confidence, boost you know, get kids excited about the idea of learning and teaching others, and that warms my heart. That's really cool to really cool to hear. Mommy does. Yeah, a Dunpeel Hunter is asking about the keyboard. No, this is actual wood. It's made of bamboo. Here. You can see the wood grain. Yeah. Um, here, if I turn it over. You can see the, the bamboo texture in there. Yeah. Uh, same with the mouse. Yeah. Um, my old one, I'd scratched up something fierce. And you could... Uh, it like it started to splinter a little bit, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, now all you need is wood case and a wood monitor. Yeah, wood motherboard. Um, wood graphics card, wood microphone, etc. Yeah. Uh, back to our documentary. Here, the bones of the unknown dinosaur are pulled from their protective plaster jackets. Yeah. Opening a jacket in the lab is always an exciting undertaking. The bone that Ian is preparing is the back middle part of the frill. And it's this bone that allows us to say for sure that this is a brand new type of dinosaur. It's a delicate operation. One slip could shatter months of work. But in the end, the prized piece of frill surfaces. What's particularly exciting is that on either side, you've got well-developed hook-like ornamentation. Nice. If this frill piece matches with the specimens Evans collected on his last dig, it'll reveal the first That's traces a of a there? face. The face yeah. of a new species. Nice. That is pretty amazing. Yeah, this clinches it. With the Come. pieces that we found <laughs> last year, we're in a position where we can actually start to put together those pieces into a very good idea of what our dinosaur looked like. I've worked with my artist um, to give a general uh, a view of what this new dinosaur would look like. Do you want to see it? Well, here it is. 
This is the first oh. reconstruction of. That's Wendy Ceratops, isn't it? The South Side Ceratops. It doesn't have a name yet, but it has these wicked drooping hooks all around the back part of the frill. This is, I think this is Wendy Ceratops. Quite long horns over the eyes. Looks like our dinosaur has quite a big nose horn, and it's a little bit unexpected. With this yeah. bone. So, Wendy Ceratops here. Here, I'll, I'll let them continue with this for a little bit, and then I'll show you what Wendy Ceratops would look like. Our dinosaur has quite a big nose horn, and it's a little yeah. bit unexpected. With this bone and this complete picture of the ornamentation on the frill of this early horned dinosaur, it just confirms that we have a brand new animal to add to the dinosaur dictionary. Every species that we find tells us something new about the diversity of past life on this planet. It's I think this video was probably made in like 2013 or something like that, Dunfield Hunter. Here, let's, let's take a look. Wendy Ceratops. Ding, ding, ding. Yes, indeed. So Wendy Ceratops. Well, can anybody take a guess why this animal is named Wendy Ceratops? Hmm. Any guesses where that name came from? Hmm. Some of you already know. I presume. Uh. <laughs> uh. Not from the fast food chain, Mayor Space. Or Commodore. It didn't really like Wendy's. No, it lived about 70 million years before Wendy's. But if you guessed that this animal was named after its discoverer, you were correct. A woman named Wendy Sloboda. Let's see if we can find a clip with her. Uh, here we go. I'm Wendy Slavota, and back in 2010, I was out looking for dinosaurs and found an unusual bone out in the Milk River Canyon area. It was a skull bone of a ceratopsian. I collected it and brought it home, prepared it, well, cleaned it up for Dr. Michael Ryan and Dr. David Evans. Dr. Ryan is yep. from... So Dave Evans was the guy you just saw... Right here, that's him. <laughs> he almost looks angry with you, chat. What did you do? <laughs> uh, that's Dave Evans right there. Um, I used to run into him all the time in the field, uh, working in Montana between like 2013 and 2016. Um, no, 2017 too. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so Wendy Sloboda discovered this dinosaur, and Michael Ryan and, and Dave Evans described it, and then they named it after Wendy Sloboda. From the Cleveland Museum, and Dr. Evans is from the Royal Ontario Museum. Yep. And they realized it was something unusual. It was looked like a different kind of dinosaur uh, than they'd seen before, just from the skull piece. So they proceeded to, after that, I showed them the site, and then they proceeded for three years to excavate a very large hole and they collected almost the entire dinosaur. It looks like it's a might be a bone bed. That's what we're seeing in this documentary is that process. The specimen is on display at the ROM, uh. Royal Ontario Museum. And the neat thing is is it's completely new and they named it after me. Wendy Ceratops Pin Hernandez. Which yep. is absolutely so exciting. I can't I don't even know how to describe it. I'm I just overwhelmed that that's what they called it it's, it's very <laughs> it's awesome so awesome that i got a tattoo on my arm of it yep she might be the only person in the world well no that's probably not the case she's one of very few people in the world who have who a discovered a new genus and species of dinosaur and then b had it you know tattooed on her that's pretty cool, you know. Imagine you're at the grocery store. You've got a cart full of groceries. And you, you know, you're you're checking out and the the checker person goes, "Oh, 
What's it? What? What's that tattoo? Is that a dinosaur? What? What? What's the? What's that about? What's the story behind that tattoo? And you get to say, with your whole chest, to say, I discovered that dinosaur. That was because of me. I found that. It's named after me. I'm Wendy. This is Wendy Ceratops. <laughs> Imagine that feeling, you know? Yeah. Um, super, super cool. Yeah, what a neat thought. Yeah. Commodore says, I can see how flustered she is. She's not used to being on, on camera. So Wendy Sloboda is an excellent person in the field. She is kind of like a living legend in terms of finding new dinosaurs. She has found so many different dinosaur fossils over the years. And um, she's made such a contribution that, you know, um, Ryan and Evans decided to name this animal after her. Which is pretty cool. That's a pretty high honor. Like, it's kind of one of the closest forms, one of the closest ways that you can get to, to immortality is to have a dinosaur named after you. You know? Especially one that you found. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It's awesome. It's so awesome that I got a tattoo on my arm of it. Yeah. And, uh, tattoo is, is, now I can just show everybody. <laughs> pretty neat. Pretty neat. Here is a link to that video there. Um... Yeah, yeah. Um, Andrew Memorex says, I was reading about how they might have found humans' earliest discovered ancestor from the time of the dinosaurs. I... Do you have a link to that, Andrew Memorex? Because our, back at the time, placental mammals, the thing closest to humans that would have lived during the time of the dinosaurs would have looked... Kind of like a squirrel. Or maybe like a shrew or a rat, depending on how you, uh... Depending on how you reconstruct it. But this is Purgatorius. Which is from just after the extinction of the dinosaurs. Except for a few birds. Um... <laughs> I love this illustration here. <laughs> Running away from a dromaeosaur. <laughs> Kind of Blair Witch Project vibes there. Um, oh, and that's it, says Andrew Memorex. Nice, nice. Is there news about Purgatorius? Yeah. Um, our earliest primate ancestors rapidly spread after dinosaur extinction. So this is from three years ago here. But yeah, yeah. Purgatorius. Um, and there's Bill Clemens there. And Greg Wilson. Bill Clemens... Um, Passed away, I think, in 2022. November of 2022. But, yeah. Um, so this is... We think it's probably pretty close to the ancestry of primates. Here's a link. Um, it hasn't been found from the age of dinosaurs yet. From It's been found from just after, in, like, the earliest Paleocene. It hasn't been found in the Cretaceous yet, but... Chances are it did exist in the Cretaceous because it's from literally just after the boundary. So chances are it it lived before then also. The idea of it diverging that quickly after the asteroid impact is a little... Um, a little far-fetched? But we don't really know. Yeah. Um... Dunbeal Hunter, that's impressive. NASCAR racing team, the French saint from the 5th century BC. You've been around a while, Dunbeal, sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, back to this. Um, yeah. The dinosaur dictionary. Every species that we find tells us something new about the diversity of past life on this planet. Yeah. It's a fun uh, challenge to... Uh, to describe and name this particular animal. Wendy Ceratops. The unnamed new we now dinosaur know the name. will go on display right here at the museum. Yeah. When I I've never been to the ROM, but I've heard good things. I try to take myself back in time to when I was five or six 
huge dinosaur lover, what would blow me away? To be able to see a new species so quickly after it was unearthed, that would make an impression on a young, budding paleontologist. Yeah. This is why David... And shoot, that's, and that's why he's doing this TV show. And that's also why I'm, you know, doing these live streams here on Twitch. And why we're going to be live streaming our fieldwork this summer. To try and bring you along for the ride. Get you excited about, about making new discoveries in the field of dinosaur paleontology. It's, um... There is something special about being there when it happens, you know? About witnessing it live, and I think that's why... That's why people love Twitch, you know? You get to be there and watch while it's happening. And that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And I think one of the reasons why, why so few people watch the VODs as compared to you know, the broadcasts when they happen is because... You know, for people who love Twitch, being there live, that's the real, the real appealing thing. And the interaction there, Claire Burr. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And, uh... Yeah, yeah. Here. Make an impression on a young, budding paleontologist. Yeah. This is why David Evans became a dinosaur hunter. For the rush <laughs> of a new discovery. To witness a prehistoric creature come to life before your eyes. Amen. Yeah. On the next Dino Hunt... In the Badlands of Alberta, a young paleontologist is looking for the last piece of the puzzle. Is that Victoria Arbor? Yeah. It wasn't collected that with a her. head or a tail club. I'd be happy to just find the hole where it had been collected from, because you never oh, know what you're going to find. She needs a better find. water bottle. If they can solve a hundred-year-old yeah. mystery, they might find the missing bones from a 74-million-year-old dinosaur. <laughs> cool. And Smurf? That would be cool, Smurf. I've never actually been to the Royal Terrell Museum. Yeah. Commodore says, did paleontology funding skyrocket in the mid-90s due to Jurassic Park? And we haven't been back to that peak? Yes, Commodore, yes. Shoot, um... When I'm in the field with, with Jim this year, I need to get him to talk about that a little bit more on camera. But basically, Jim Kirkland was a dinosaur paleontologist before Jurassic Park. And there... He says that there would be maybe, like... I think it would be like maybe one or two dinosaur paleontology jobs that would have an opening every year in the United States prior to Jurassic Park. But from like 1993 onward, through the mid-90s, through the early 2000s really, it was like suddenly you have ten times as many dinosaur paleontology jobs. And a lot more funding available. And we are... Jim always says that, like, you know, the good old days of dinosaur paleontology are right now. We're living through them. This is, like, a golden age of dinosaur paleontology right now. Even if the funding isn't always easy to come by, the public enthusiasm and the the attention that we get for discoveries and, and the number of jobs that are out there, it's still way fewer than there are people who want to be dinosaur paleontologists and work professionally as dinosaur paleontologists in a tenure track faculty position or a museum scientist role or something like that but still it's it's a lot you know there's there's more opportunity today than there has been for most of the history of dinosaur paleontology yeah yeah anyway let's continue and in a secret bc location Stop filming. A husband and wife team have uncovered the province's first complete dinosaur, lying right where it died. There's no roads into the site, so we have to take it out by air. Wow. They can get it out of the ground, but can they get it in the air? We'll be worried. We'll be worried. We'll be concerned. Oh, man. They just ought to, ought to have it's built the a season of the dinosaur. framework around that. Um, Ivan99PG says, what's your favorite dinosaur? Oh, I've got, I've got a lot of favorite dinosaurs, Ivan. But I can show you one that's not that's not part of that that list there in chat. Yeah, it's Triarchuncus here. This 
is Trirarchuncus prairiensis. This is a hook-handed, probably insect-eating, feathered dinosaur from the very end of the Cretaceous period, from the same time as as Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops and Kylosaurus, Pachycephalosaurus. Same time and place. It lived alongside all those dinosaurs. And this has got a, a special place in my heart because... Because I helped work on it. Uh, I'm one of the authors on the original descriptive study for Trirarchuncus. Fowler et al. 2020. In, uh, that's a model that I uh, sculpted and 3D printed. But it would have looked something like this in life. This is a, a very, very close relative called Mononychus. From, uh, from Mongolia. Mononychus, there is a, a possibility that this is this is the ancestor of Trirarchuncus. They come out as, as sister species, uh, as sister taxes, so they're each other's closest relative, it seems. Um, so yeah, yeah. Wait, yay, nepotism. <laughs> of course, the dinosaur that's one of my favorites is one of my dinosaurs. My dinosaurs. It's true, Commodore. Yeah, I've got a particular, particularly close relationship with this dinosaur, so that is one of the reasons why it's one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, and how far is it from life size? This is about one half, or maybe one third of life size. Yeah, they were they were bigger in life. Um, but like a couple meters long. Not a huge animal. And, uh, here, I'll show you this, uh, modern classic clip of Mononychus. Basically the same animal as this, except it lived in the deserts of Mongolia, just before this animal lived. Here. Mononychus is a desert specialist. Such hypersensitive directional hearing gives her a mental map of this hollow log and what lies within. Yeah. <laughs> she now uses the weapon that gives this hunter its name. Mononychus. Single giant claw. Yeah. Just what she needs to open a termite's nest. You know, fossil whales where you live. Interesting, Ivan. You're not from Chile, are you? A lot of cool fossil whales from Chile, but from a lot of other places around the world, too. And she has another special piece of equipment a flexible tongue. Twice the length of her head. We don't know if they actually had a tongue like this, but it would make a lot of sense. Tongues don't fossilize easily. You kind of have to guess. An From Italy. Oh, cool, Ivan. Meal. Very cool. If only termites weren't quite so irritating. You do have some uh, some cool dinosaurs from Italy. Um, yeah, critters like Scipionix. It's famously from Italy. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find a good video on it, but Scipionix. Beautifully preserved specimen. A juvenile could be a, could even be like a, a baby of a larger meat-eating dinosaur. We're not really sure. But there's the fossil right there. Really, really beautiful fossil. It actually, it's so well preserved that it has guts inside. There we go. Fossilized viscera. Entrails. Guts. This is exceptionally rare. 
yeah, yeah. So anyway, as a dinosaur paleontologist, when I think of Italy and its fossil heritage, I think of the dinosaurs from Italy, like Scipionics. Uh... <laughs> Lenina says, I want so badly to hear David Attenborough say, a mighty mlem. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, um, oh, this is really cool. Where have I seen this before? But yeah, fossil forest in Italy, super neat. This is going to be after the age of dinosaurs, I presume. Um, yeah. Fossil forest of Donoroba, three, kilometer, three kilometers from Farnetta. It's one of the world's oldest forests. Two million years ago, the oceans withdrew from the area, leaving an ancient lake. Tiberino. Um, yeah, so I guess that's an extant forest. That looked way too well preserved to be, you know, actually super ancient. So it said there it was about, about two million years old. Very cool. Neat. Neat stuff. Well, welcome, welcome. Ivan, it's good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. And uh, Diagnosis is named after Scipio? Yeah, Scipionics is named after Scipio. The name means Scipio Claw. Here, I'll show you. There we go. Generic name means Scipio's Claw. Pretty neat. Uh, uh, the fossil's out of a juvenile that was most likely a baby. Only half a meter, 20 inches long, and perhaps just three days old. That's adult form and size is unknown. Yeah. I wouldn't be shocked if it's like a super juvenile Carcharodontosaur or something like that. You know? Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. And Claire Burr, very funny. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and go ahead and post that, that link, Andrew Memorex, if it'll let you. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Um, and what is this? Yeah, this sounds more sensational than it is. Um, they're going to say that the origin of placental mammals is before the KPG boundary, which I think we'd already kind of agreed is the case. I don't know how new this really is. Um, yeah. Primates, rabbits, dogs, and dinosaurs living in harmony. None of those groups lived with dinosaurs. Primates hadn't evolved yet. Rabbits hadn't evolved yet. Dogs hadn't evolved yet. You might have, like, super, super basal lagomorphs. Or, you know, like, stem primates or something. But certainly didn't have dogs. This is very, very misleading. Bordering on, like, a lie. Yeah. Anyway, is this from fossil evidence or from uh, more like molecular study and speculation? <laughs> we need a link to the actual paper here. kind of a misleading way.
do they not have a link to the paper here? I'm not seeing one. It should either be right at the beginning or right at the end. And it... Hmm. Also, this is from July of 2023. That's from last summer. Um... Yeah, yeah. Anyway. And yeah, Rigodactylus, not not the best. You're right. All their hyperlinks are to their own articles. Yeah, I... This doesn't seem like a great site for... Yeah. Earth.com. And Rocky Alters, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway. Um, and exactly diagonal, yeah. So that would be like the origin. Well, we already knew that placental mammals were a thing. I think before the KPG boundary. But... And I think we might even have... I think there might be molecular data that hints that... Lagomorphs may have split off from like stem rodents even before then, but I'm not totally sure. Make them away downtown, walking fast, faces pass, and I'm home. And Rocky Alters, thank you for the four months of support. Which unfollowed me, but I found my way back anyway. Excited to be able to tune in as always, if after a relatively long hiatus. Rocky Alters, it is great to have you back. Welcome, welcome back to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, Andrew Memorex, to, um, to make it really, really clear, what that article was kind of clumsily trying to explain and, like, kind of getting wrong is that basically during the time of the dinosaurs, during the last days of the dinosaurs, the ancestor of critters like dogs, humans, rabbits would have been a critter that looked kind of like this. I think there's still a lot of dispute about which of these fossil organisms are actually ancestral to our modern organisms. But, yeah, Purgatorius here I think is thought to be ancestral to... Yeah, the earliest examples of primates are proto-primates. So yeah, basically, if you're a mammal that lived during the age of dinosaurs, you're going to look roughly like this. Either you're going to look like a mouse, or a squirrely thing, or a shrewy thing. Or maybe, if you're really, really huge, you might look like kind of a badgery or Tasmanian devil -y thing, or an opossum -y thing. But this is basically what mammals looked like during the age of dinosaurs. There were no bats, there were no camels, there were no whales, there were certainly no humans or anything that looked like a human back then. There weren't even any monkeys or lemurs or anything like that. This is as close as you're going to get to a person during the age of dinosaurs. So yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And is that the title of the paper? Um, current biology... Thank you, Rachidactylus and Kodali. Good stuff. Good stuff. Here. There we go. This looks like it's actually the... Yeah, this makes sense. Yeah, June 27, 2023. Timeline lines up. I think this is probably the paper. Yeah, open access. No paywall. You love to see it. Yeah, let's see. We introduced an extended Bayesian, Brownian bridge model that estimates the age of orig origination and where applicable extinction through a probabilistic interpretation of the fossil record. This model estimates the origination of placental mammals in the late Cretaceous with ordinal crown groups originating at or after the KPG boundary. 
Uh, the results reduce the plausible interval for placental mammal origination of younger range of molecular clock estimates. Makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, the origination of many modern mammal lineages overlapped with and followed the KPG mass extinction. So basically, when we're looking at... I don't know, let's just use land mammals of Florida as an example. Or land mammals of North America. Basically, every single one of these all came from, like, probably a few common ancestors during the late Cretaceous. In fact, it may have just been, like, one or two species of mammal that made it through that extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous that gave rise to all of these. Like, it might be as narrow as one or two species. I don't know. That might be that might be exaggerating a bit. But no Yeah. There were no bison during the time of the dinosaurs. There were no bears, there were no elk, there were no cougars or cats of any kind. There were no wolves or dogs or boars or pigs or anything. Basically, all of your little mammals would have looked something like this or this or this, you know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you for for investigating that Rachidactylus and Code Dolly. I appreciate it. Yeah. And Rocky Alter says, is there any value to saying those one to two species were rodents or canine, etc., as we would understand current species? So they wouldn't be rodents or canines, but they would be kind of basal placental mammals. So... Let me show you on our tree of life here. Yeah. So, mammals are here on our tree of life. Let's zoom into them. Yeah. There we go. So, mammals. Um, before mammals, you had what we call stem mammals, which were like kind of weird proto mammals most of which laid eggs, and most of the mammals that lived during the time of the dinosaurs were of these various, like, stem groups. Um, and, like, non... Many of them were true mammals, but they're not... Yeah, they'd be kind of in between monotremes and therian mammals. So there are all of these groups that were different back then. Most of the mammals that lived during the time of the dinosaurs laid eggs, we think. But then you had a few species of Therian mammal that evolved, and they're kind of doing their thing, and during the Age of Dinosaurs, they split into two groups. Uh, the Metatherian mammals, also known as marsupials, and the Eutherian mammals, also known as placental mammals. And so it may have been just a few species of placental mammals and a few species of Metatherians, marsupials, that survived at the end of the uh, the Cretaceous period. And they would have been like little, almost shrew-like little things. And then from those humble beginnings, they evolved into all of the wild and wacky mammals that have lived since. Rodents, primates, and more. And your uh, carnivorans, bats, hedgehogs, and more. You know, the Laurasia theers. And uh, the Atlantogenodons. And the Afrotheres. We are going to be talking about Afrotheres a bunch tomorrow. So this is actually kind of the perfect place to end our stream for today. Don't go away just yet. But tomorrow, we're going to be talking about sea cows, manatees, and dugongs, and their sea cow relatives which are related to critters like elephants. Yeah. Not to whales, though. Manatees and whales, not anywhere close to each other. In terms of, of mammal groups, you know? So yeah, yeah. Anyway, we'll be talking about sea cows tomorrow. For... Manatee Appreciation Day. That is going to be a ton of fun. 
so I hope you'll join me for that. Uh, um, but yeah, shoot, I need to end today's stream early because I am going to go see Dune 2 with Ios and Delta Rain. They're not starring in the movie. I'm going to see the movie with them. So, uh... I guess in honor of the Yale Peabody Museum reopening, there's a Deinonychus skull that will run our credits over here. And let's see who else is doing some science on Twitch right now. Uh, let's see... Um... Let's see, Astro Canuck is on right now. Let's go see what he's up to. Nice, he's doing some Lego stuff. Astro Canuck does a lot of like science outreach about about space, astronomy, telescopes. So if that sounds interesting to you. He does a lot of Legos as well, and I think that's what he's working on right now. Always a fun time over at Astro Canuck. There's so many things going on on the screen. He's got some of the coolest alerts and overlays, and it's nuts what he's able to pull off there. So uh, you're in for a treat, everybody. Till next time, everybody, you take care of yourselves. Thank you to everybody who's appeared here in our credits. All of the support both in terms of viewership, and followage, and financial support, and moderator support, and everything else. Thank you, thank you, all of you. I really appreciate you. Everybody who's been purchasing items off of the wish list, too, for our field work. Ethan's kind of blown away at the uh, number of items. So, yeah. Anyway. It's Manatee Appreciation Day tomorrow. I hope you'll tune in then. It's going to be a good time. I'll see you then. Let's go right into Astro Canuck. Bye-bye. Oh